Shall we kick off, ladies, gentlemen? If we can make our way to our chairs, that would be good. Good morning, all. Anthony, you've got a, I've got um, people trying to work out your acronyms, uh, so I'll get you to tell them at some point. When we do the uh, red photo, I'll give you the next Okay. Justin Pluto, Bundy is with the Y. Yeah. All right. Bundy, Bundy. Okay. Um, Raj, apologies for the delay starting, but again, um, just a reminder of whose country you're on, Wurundjeri country, um, and also the values that we talked about yesterday around caring and sharing and respect and an acknowledgement of your own unique and special qualities. And you all, I was thinking about this last night, your desire to come together, make sense of this process, get some clarity around all the moving parts and identify the synergies and just commit to working together. If you think that you've tricked me over there, moving around, I can see where you are. Um, and my deadly sister here was there. <laughs> That's all right. But you know what I notice of you? Same duds, different top. No, don't worry about it. I'm the same. I'm the same. Now, um, there'll be a few conversations that you can have throughout the day with yourselves. But at, towards the end of the day, I want us to start thinking table by table about what you think is needed to improve a process, if that makes sense, yeah? How do we make this real for everybody? There were some questions, issues that came up yesterday in terms of we can't assume all Aboriginal people struggle to understand some of the, the terminology. Um, some Aboriginal groups will just pick it up and run with it. They'll understand it completely. They're capable of doing what they want to do, but there'll be needs to adjust in certain environments. But so I was saying that one, one, what works in one community won't necessarily work in another community. So we just need to be mindful of that. And the only thing I'll say is that at some point, all of this language and acronyms and words, 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 have got to be put into some sort of one page picture um, so that everybody can see where it all fits pretty much, and that would be helpful for a lot of Aboriginal people, I'm sure. Okay, now, Subodesonak, <clears throat> Subodesonak, good morning, Raj. Yeah, be polite and courteous in as many languages as we can. Um, you're going to present today on the NRL's upcoming season. And you'll probably report a little bit on the Big Bash final for Saturday night, I wish the Brisbane Heat got into. Huh? <laughs> no. Raj is going to talk to us today about just another acronym, uh, IRIS services and sensitive data environments. So I'll get you to start coming up, Raj. Um, Rajiv. So Raj, Rajiv. Yeah, Rajiv. Raj is your homie name, yeah. yeah. Um, Rajiv Semaraj is a senior research fellow and the program coordinator for data and anal analytics at the Melbourne Institute, Applied Economic and Social Research, leading institute for applied economic and social research within the Faculty of Business and Economics. Rajiv has over 13 years experience in data analytics data visualization and developing statistical methodologies for data analysis. Past experiences involved transition of engineering concepts to the health science as seen through the work he did with, for his PhD in deriving meaningful quantifiable information from image data. Presently, Rajiv is translating his engineering experience into uh, to innovative data analytics 
and data visualization in the social sciences, including oversight of Melbourne Institute Data Lab, lead for the foundation fellow training program and is integral and is integral to the IRIS integrated research infrastructure and social service platforms. So we'll hand you the floor. Hi, everybody. Good morning. I have the pleasure of uh, where's the little doodiki? Okay. I have the pleasure of being your first talk today. So I'll try not to make it. I'll try to keep it as upbeat as possible to get the pace going for the rest of the day. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the country um, uh, we're, we're on today, um, which is the Wurundjeri people. But I'd also like to acknowledge the the Bunurong and Bunurong people of which um, are the land I live in, um, because we've all worked from home for the past three years. And a lot of what I'm going to show to you today was inspired, um, was done in this land and the land I, I live in um, as we work from home. Ooh. Um, so as, uh, as Grant mentioned, I'm, I am an engineer, um, so that's a disclaimer. I am not a social scientist and I'm not in the H-A-S-S and I am not, unfortunately. So this was a, a joke we used to have there right you now when I did my PhD at Monash. Uh, this was stuck on the door outside where all the PhD students were working and uh, we all thought it was funny, but um, so yeah, do not disturb. Uh, but I want to start by saying, um, so I guess yet another acronym, um, what is IRIS, but you no, know, I don't need to, uh, um, Michael and Wojtek did a, a, two excellent talks yesterday talking about the integrated, re integrated re uh, research infrastructure for social sciences um, yesterday. Um, so I'm not going to start, start on that. But um, we, the IRIS project essentially splits into um, six work packages, um, of which is yet many more acronyms, but around, um, you know, and a lot of work packages around, you know, survey um, design, uh, the geosocial elements that we heard about yesterday, um, also the curation aspect as well. But today, I'm, my work package is actually a part of a work package, actually, um, is around sensitive data analysis demonstrator. And what this work package is about is about, so we have all this integration work we're doing and my work package, our work package is about, okay, now how do we take that work that we're doing and how do we move it to a sensitive environment? If we're using sensitive data, a lot of the time we cannot use um, sensitive data in our laptops or in our own computers. So we're gonna take it to an external environment. So a lot of that work is done around how do we demonstrate that? And for phase one, we had, went through, did some work around looking at some of the requirements people had around working with data, uh, some of the pitfalls when it comes to accessing data, especially sensitive data, um, and you know some of the issues there. Um, and now we're currently working towards the development phase, which is around you know architecting what that integration exercise looks like in a sensitive environment, and then moving on to how do we create a pilot of that. And that's just phase one, but I'll talk, touch on you know, future work at the end of, this, end of the talk. So I thought I'll start here with what I mean about sensitive data and no better place to start than starting with the Privacy Act. Um, and so, you know, personal information um, really means information about identif identifiable information. Um, and so what this really means, you know, individual's name, um, signature, address, um, record employee record information and a few other things. Um, so that's personal identifiable information, but there's also sensitive information. And what this is defined is to be around your racial origin, um, political opinions, um, philosophical beliefs, um, and a range of other sensitive information. So now this is very sensitive data and where social scientists want access to this data is around making, in, perform, creating, undertaking research analysis and informing social policy and evaluating social policy. So as, as you can understand, there's obviously a lot of risks and a lot of issues with accessing this type of data, especially, and we talked a lot yesterday about, you know, the data owners who are the rightful owners of that data. We are, um, you know, everybody, everybody owns their own data. 
but it's about how can we better use the data, still enable research, but also be like be be um, um, what do you call it? we we honor the owners of the data. So our experience usually with data is so we have a data custodian; they collect the data, um, and they usually link the data to another another couple another data set. Um, then they undertake some work around um, curating the data to create something that's a bit more research ready. And once that's done, that's what you call, that's what you get the data set. And this data set usually is not something we can access, right? So depending on what information goes, especially with sensitive data. So usually what happens is there's some treatment is done to this data before we get access to it. And so you, so what we call open data, we have we get access to a, a data we can just download from the website, but there's usually some licensing that we have to agree to. We have to attribute where we get the data from. And that's where we get, to, that's how the user gets access, direct access to the data. Another model is the limited access model. So in this model, you have specific agreements that you have to sign that you say you will you know, use this data in a specific way. Um, and you usually have to, Create a project summary. You know what 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 do you intend to use the data for? What are you going to do? Do you have ethics clearance? And usually there'll be a reduction of the level of detail in the data, so addresses won't be um, um, you know revealed. Um, they'll all be coded down to a specific geographical level. Um, you know, ages might be done in brackets, um, and or you might be even aggregate level at a national level or a state level. Data and you can get access to this data and you can use it in an environment. The other method is accessing it through a secure access environment. And this is once again, you have more controls. Again, you have access agreements of confidentiality need polls. You'll have to undertake some sort of security training um, before you can access the data that tells you how you can use the data, what you can do with it. Also about what you need to do to the data before you can take it out of the environment, which is very, very critical. Once you get access to the environment, then you have your, the data, you can get the data, then you can clean your data some more. You can then do your analysis. And then once again, I put treatment at the end there because you'll need to do specific things to make sure you can take only specific counts out of the environment before you can even take the data out. So for example, there's specific rules around, you know, um, each table must have at least 10 counts before you can take it out because you might be able to identify someone within the data. Um, other things like you know looking for dominance, which is where if you have you know a data set and you know you know one value is much much larger than the other, then you'll be able to infer who that person or that individual or the business was through the data you're taking out. So you'll be very careful. So once again, you do more treatment before you can take the data out. So, what is a sensitive access environment? Um, there's lots of words for it. There's lots of names for it. Um, Trusted research environment, secure data environment, data safe haven, um, secure data laboratory. I love that one. Um, but there's lots of it. And they all kind of do mean um, very similar things. Um, back then, uh, a long time ago, I guess some, some of you might remember, I think we still have this actually. We have secure access was, you know, you would apply for a data set and you'll have to go to a specific location they do a retina scan, fingerprint, give the name, you know, your kid's birth certificate. And then you get in and then you would access your data set. And then somebody will be watching over you. You can almost hear them breathing down your neck while you're accessing and doing certain things with data. And then, you know, you can get out and be like, oh my goodness. Um, but that was, that was just very physical, secure environments. And then we've kind of, from then we moved to, trusted execution environments where you'd come up with some code, you'd work with some dummy data, and you'll give it to someone, you'll give your code to someone, so your program to someone, and they'd run it on the data for you. You would not actually see anything, and then they'll give you the output. It's a bit like table builder, really, um, which we still use. Um, and then we, from then on, we moved to, okay, we can access an environment. It looks, you know, um, looks like a virtual desktop. It even looks like Windows has your data in there. So that's more of a modern concept of a data lab or data environment. Um, I'll be talking a lot more about sensitive data and sensitive environments next week. 
um, at the summer workshop. So if you are ever, if you are in Sydney, um, I would like to say um, hi to you and you know speak further on this matter. But just wanted to put an ad out there. So I guess where I come into the picture, with, where we come into the picture with Iris is we built the Melbourne Institute Data Lab middle, sorry, grant, yet another acronym. Um, but we like the name middle. Um, I'll, I'll share a funny story. Um, so we have middle, which, which stands for Melbourne Institute Data Lab, which was a secure environment we built. But I sit in the administration team and guess what we call them, uh, the meeting? We call it the middle management team meeting. So, uh, yeah. So, um, so the middle uh, is a is a purpose built environment that we built for analysis to secure um, social science data, specifically to um, undertake analysis using survey data or government administrative data, um, as well as random uh, control, randomized control trial data. Um, we built it in late 2021 uh, as an established as an agreement uh, between uh, Bimble Institute and a company called Psychonsole, which is a security professional services team in in Canberra. Um, and we also got a lot of support from the University of Melbourne um, in building it, um, business services, legal and risk, and whatnot. And it was also built with funding from the Paul Ramsey Foundation and the University of Melbourne. Um, And so what it is, is it's a remote access environment. Um, uh, you, the user, would go to a web browser, you type a, a, a browser, what do you call, um, a web URL. Um, this is how you access it. Um, not gain access, we'll talk about, about that later. Um, but how you would normally access your data is you go to a web browser, you log in, you'd get access to a Windows environment, which looks exactly like your Windows environment, but it's a lot more closed down. And then you'd have your um, data in a, in, a, in a drive, and then you'd have all your statistical packages you'd need to analyze your data, and you want to take all the analysis you want inside that Windows environment. I was going to put a picture up of, of it, but I would have just put a picture of what Windows looks like, and that would have been quite boring. So instead, I made a pretty picture of it. But the, the main thing here is when you need to take data in, you need someone needs to approve it, someone needs to authorize and vet it, vet it and uh, approve it. Um, before you can take it out of the environment. And you don't have access to things like internet and email and things like that, but you know. So how do you get access to it? Um, typically um, a researcher or a group of researchers would submit a project application. And in this application, you'd write what you want the, re what you want the data for, what data sets you want, or what data sets are you bringing into the environment? Um, what are you using it for? Um, what are your questions? What do you, what do you, what are your, what is the research objectives and your plan? And this uh, application would get vetted internally by the team, but then it would also, depending on what data sharing agreements we have, we might have to engage the data custodians to make sure, can I give access to that data? Can I give such and such person X access to data? If they say no, then we can't give you access, but we haven't had that happen yet. Um, and then you undergo training. So we have a security awareness training, which talks about, you know, what you can and cannot do in the data, into the environment. Um, this includes things like, you know, try to identify yourself in the data set you see, you can't do that. Identify your friends, you know, or if you think you can identify somebody, then you need to tell us about it. So training around, you know, what you can and do, cannot do in the environment. Um, we also give the option for data custodians to give us specific training material if they want users to go through additional material as well in, in, on top of what we do because they might have specific things around here, you know, which laws that they need to abide by by accessing our data. And once a project, then we get the project approval. Um, once that's done, we get the user agreements and confidentiality deed pools um, signed. Um, let's see if it works. Ah, it works. Um, and then there's two ways you can access the data. Once uh, through what we call a standalone project, which is where you have your project, you have your data, and that's it. And you have your tools and you know the people you were, that were on your form, they can access the environment. Um, and um, that's it, nobody else can access. The other method is what we call a shared data environment, which is where it's essentially a, a group of projects um, that can work together, um, but under a specific research theme. So they're essentially done by themes. So it might be on, 
we're investigating. Uh, we know we're, we're a, a shared data environment around employment, around you know looking at um, employment. So we're bringing a whole range of data sets on that. Um, and the idea is this permitted data set that you can have and different projects can access different data sets. And once you have that, you have that output clearance process, um, which means you know, all projects must, all outputs must be um, vetted by the data custodian and or someone delegated before they can be cleared out of the environment. So let me talk about a bit more about the shared data environment because this is one of the things we really like about the environment is we want to build a community of practice. And this is done basically through an internal wiki. Uh, part of it's done through a wiki where we create a range of um, uh, material. Um, the users create material on the wiki and they can share within their shared data environment with other projects. They can share code. They can share things they learned about a data set. You know, I was analyzing a data set and um, I found that income brackets were really useless or I found that something was wrong. And I wrote some code that basically found a way to treat those income brackets to the way I want to do something. Or I found that I was analyzing census data and I didn't like the way, the, the depending on how the question was posed in the form, that means there might be some issues with the data we're actually collecting about the household. So those are sort of issues I can write down in a wiki and then I can share with my colleagues within the environment and anybody who uses that data set, there's a data set, every each data set has their own wiki. And depending on what you cannot, what which data you can and cannot see, you'll get access to different wikis. So, but then you can learn more about the data and you can access sample code and that you can then use that on your environment, on your own project. Um, another thing I should mention is shared data environments also mean you can have your own governance framework around who gets access to that project. Um, for obvious reasons, if your project is about a specific um, field of research, employment poverty, then there'll be specific things around, well, if you're not doing, you know, there'll be mechanisms around, you know, who can access that data and that project and that those resources. Uh, another thing within the shared data environment is this concept of a, of a research ready data set. Um, so um, we as well, engineers and social scientists also, we always find that we always do, we get access to a data and we sometimes we find ourselves doing the exact same thing on a data set before we need to analyze it. We all do it, you know, we always take it, we always transform in a specific way and we're all doing it and there's all this lost time in effort in creating that. So what we want to do is we, if we find that we're always doing a specific thing, then we can go halfway and we can document what we do. And then we can create a program in multiple languages, you know, Stata, R, Python, that can then mimic you to get to that point in time. So you get the as provided data, which is what we call the data we get from the data custodian. And then there's a step that takes you to the research ready data. And so with the research ready data, some of the key features we want to have is, you know, it should be available for broad research, not just for a specific thing, right? Because then that the researchers themselves can do that bit. But we know that we, we make sure the data is meaningful and is usable for research and statistical purposes. Um, you know, it should be accessible and be allowed to be reused. Um, and there's sufficient robustness checks that we've done and we've documented on how we've done that data quality checks, data quality statements that we would incorporate if the data custodian hasn't provided them to us. Um, and any measures of relevance specific to that shared data environments. If you're investigating about poverty, then there'll be poverty measures included into it, I mean, new variables included into it. Um, and then also there's the relevant programs um, or code. Um, so I guess um, one of our biggest, uh, the shared data environment that started it all is what's called, it's called the Breaking Down Barriers Shared Data Environment. So this was the one that was funded by the Paul Ramsey Foundation. And this was uh, the first one. And the idea behind this shared data environment is to inform and shape policy around understanding disadvantage and poverty in Australia. So we've done quite a few reports um, um, within the Breaking Down Barriers project and the shared data environment we're working towards currently with a range of other um, data custodians, ABS, ATO, uh, DSS or Services Australia, depending who you talk to, um, you know, bringing a range of admin data into the environment. Um, we're also talking to a few other service providers like Brotherhood St. Lawrence, Brotherhood St. Lawrence, and um, you know, bringing other data sets in as well. Um, and as part of this, you know, we're building data sets or we're bringing data sets. Uh, we're undertaking reviews on you know specific topics relating to poverty. 
and they were also um, um, writing longer pieces of work called what we call demon demonstration reports. Here's an example of what it looks like, what such a wiki would look like. Um, this is uh, you know, a wiki. Um, oh, this doesn't have a pointer, but you can see on the left hand side of the of the wiki, there you know the specific, you know, we can get specific details about the data set. Um, you know, the how do you get access to it? But we also give what we call the data snapshot, which tells you, you know, what's the name of the data, what's the overview of what the data set is, who do you contact if you want to get access to the data? Very important. Um, you know, what's the sampling framework? How is the data collected? Um, you have the coverage um, and, you know, any other data quality. So it's like a very brief snapshot. And then we do like a deep dive into the data. We know what variables are there. So this is the data set we created for this project using census data, uh, using cross-sectional um, individual level census data. So then, you know, we have what population measures are captured, you know, what question was used, what was the census question, what was variable, how was it developed? So we capture all that information and put it into a big, into a big wiki form. Um, and so with this, um, we have a data governance model um, that we are currently working on at the moment around, you know, there's a data governance body which sits around, you know, between the data custodians and the data um, users. So that sits around, you know, how is data access? Um, how do we look at data access? You know, what, how do we talk to the data custodians around, you know, who gets access to data? Because not everybody can get access to the data, let's be honest, right? So you have to, you have to, the data, the data users or the potential data users really need to state why they need the data what they need and what, you know, what are they gonna do with it and for how long. So that governance body is around making sure that we have that conversation and we have that vetting process to, um, to vet that. Um, we also sit, we have a couple of other, other middle governance structures, you know, between, you know, our technical advisory group and um, executive council and you know, information security council that's related to the security of the uh, system. Um, oh, I forgot to mention the security bit. So yeah, so we, um, the system is, uh, we got our IRAP certification last year um, for protected level um, under the Australian government standard. And we're currently working towards um, accreditation of the new uh, Data Availability and Transparency Act, the data scheme. So we're working towards accreditation for that at the moment, um, which is quite a process. And so uh, because of the security of the level uh, data, our uh, sensitivity of the data we host, uh, we had to get sign off from universities um, um, Vice Chancellor uh, and the CTO. So, because of, we have we have to be represented on, on the because of the risks associated with the data we host and the, on the platform we provide, we have to we have to be represented on the Information Security Council. So, I should have covered on the security earlier. Um, and under that, we have the data stewards. So, if you're bringing data, like I said, with the breaking down barriers, um, different between different data sets, um, they get to work with what we call um, data specialists and data curators um, in creating this research ready data. Um, so they know what specific um, focus they need to have. And then the data use and under that, we have the output vetting policies and other policies in there. So for IRIS, um, what we're looking at for phase one is um, essentially taking the geosocial work that Michael and Wojtek went through yesterday and taking it out of the computer environment, which is you know your personal laptop or your workstation at work and putting into a, into a sensitive environment. And with that comes specific complexities around internet access. You know, if you wanna access an API, well, you can't. So we have to write in specific rules into the firewall, specific to your project, might be at specific user level too, um, around how you can get access to specific APIs, specific um, other tools outside, outside the environment. So for us, it's around working with the geosocial, so bringing the scripts in, um, and then, so when a user, you know, goes in and writes what they want, they want to do the integration work, we need to have specific scripts that talk to Orin's technology, Orin's infrastructure, um, UQ infrastructure, and then bring that all back in to our environment so that we can still keep that integration exercise alive. Um, and then we're putting the curation part in through the wiki that I was just talking about um, back into the, into the project. Um, and then that creates an integrated data set and then the copies of the executed scripts and whatnot. And then if you want to vet it out, you still have to go through the same process again as before. That's what we're working towards phase one. And what we're looking for the future is really around, okay, so we have an environment, so what? Right, that's what I always keep thinking. There's lots of other environments out there. So 
for us, it's about making sure we can get researchers access to the data they want, but also access, you know, specific features on APIs and other cloud-based services, but also kind of going back to what we call like a data market. So we have Cadre, which, you know, um, at ANU, we also have Data Place, which is by ONDC. So there's all these data markets where you can access data or you can request data. So we need to be able to talk to each other, talk to the data market, but through that talk to other sensitive environments as well. Because right now, I don't know, like, Right now, I find it really difficult when I have to go to ABS Data Lab, I do my work there, and then I get my re results, you know, I finish my work, and then I go to take it out. And then they vet, then they, when it goes through the vetting process, I've already taken out half my counts. And then I put it back into my lab. And then it's like, oh, well, that's kind of pointless. Or if I put it somewhere else, like that's kind of pointless. So what if there needs to be a way where sensitive environments need to talk to each other? And the key part to that is the credentials or accreditation. So if you have IRA, if you have ISO, ISM, five safes, you know, we need to have work towards a, a mechanism where you need to know, okay, I'm sending somebody to the middle, the data custodian needs to know, okay, yep, they're vetted, they, they have some, you know, credentials, so it's safe to send the data. So I feel like we as scientists talk to each other, venues like this, and I know the cybersecurity specialists talk to each other in their symposiums, but where are the scientists talking to the cybersecurity folks, right? And working towards, you know, how do we get, how do we get to this, right? So that's just my last comment there. Um, so there's the growing need. I want to close with um, for granting access and enable better use and reuse of data. And there is no one size fits all um, when it comes to data labs. Um, so it's about making access to, you know, it's all based on what project and what work and what data you want. Um, and lastly, you know, enabling faster and richer analysis um, using a broad range of data sets is critical um, with minimal risks to the, to the data owner. It's critical for our research. Thank you. Any questions? Um, I, I want to say the hate of having to go into a physical dark room in the middle of a of a building to access sensitive data is not that far back. I I did it in 2019 with. Uh, you still have those rooms and with yeah, the, yeah. When we were evaluating the Melbourne supervised injecting room uh, and accessing um, Medicare data and PBS and all sorts of very very sensitive data. So I wanted to ask that is is Middle an accredited data service provider for for data sets curated? by um, groups like the Australian in Institute of Health and Welfare for Medicare, PBS, and all of this. Um, that's one part of the question. Another part of the question is, um, I presume it operates on a cost recovery model of sorts. So there is a, yep, it a is charge a cost recovery. Yep. Yep. It is a cost recovery. And in terms of the ADSP, yes, that's the, uh, we're putting in an application. Well, once I can get um, Deputy Vice Chancellor to sit down and have a chat with me, and then I can uh, submit it. Um, but we're very close to submitting that. And the idea is it, we're not thinking as it's a, as a University of Melbourne solution, it's a national um, application. So, yeah, we, we're open to working with others as well. Yeah, But we're not going in for a, a data integration service. No. We're going to let AIHW and NOVCD all do that. Yeah. yeah. And the last qu question is um, who can access Middle to work? Is it internal for University of Melbourne? Is it open to external partners? Anybody. Yeah. So if you're if you're from a research institute or if you're in Australia, you can access it. Um, that's a good. Yeah, I should have mentioned that. Yeah. Thanks. Isabel. Are you guys thinking of becoming one of those accredited? Uh, data facilities under the Data Availability and Transparency Act? Yes, yes. So that's why uh, the ADSB um, accreditation. So we're very close to that, um, finishing that. Actually, we finished it. We're just waiting for approval to submit. So, um, yes. Mike there. Thanks, thanks, Raj. Um, 
this is operating now, right? The, yes. Yeah. Yep. So the, I was just wondering about um, the length of the process between when a researcher conceives of an idea and then when they actually get access and they can start their analysis. What's the what's is it? Do you have a typical time frame or kind of what's the best case scenario between? I'm I'm just thinking about the the productivity commission had a report about the the data and digital dividend and this is kind of the counter to this that this you know this process is slow that's my my kind of can, can you give us some kind of real world data about how much time elapses between the researcher creating their concept and then actually putting it into practice so if the, if we already have the data within the environment um we've done it in three four days getting everything running so it, it once again it's once you get the once we get the application is about how quickly we get them enrolled onto the training and once the training's done it's literally half a day to get the project up and running so we've done it within three four days that said we it once again depends on the, if the data is there if we have the data within the environment so that's the main blocker for us so if we had to go and talk to somebody else about getting the data that's different um so one of the just to say one of our critical user requirements that we had was we have to do it within a week Right, or we have to try our best to do it within a week because I know sometimes we do that and we would just wait a month to get the data. So it's, it's, it goes back to once again to the data, if the data is available within the environment or not. Hi, I have a question from online from Margie Smith uh, who asks, with the data, data and Transparency Act yep. uh, accreditation, Will you need to have um, accredited users, won't you, for that? Y yes. Um, so the ONDC has two parts to the accreditation um, um, system. So there's accredited users and then the accredited data service providers. So you have to be an accredited user to access the data or to access the data services within the data service provider. And um, I should have actually had a slide up there. Um, with the data services provider, there's three data services that they can provide. So that is secure access. They can provide complex um, data integration or de-identification or all three. Um, so we're going for de-identification and for secure access. Um, but yes, but you'll need to be an accredited user, yes. Thank you. So we should just make a clarification on that. There's a very interesting part of the DAT Act, which is there, which is none of the people in this room will be an accredited user. It's actually your institution. Okay. So the user in that system uh, is the, you know, the University of Melbourne, Australian National University and so forth. Um, so there is a, and the ARDC is coordinating some of this work, um, the a process of accreditation the institutions have to go through, which is actually fairly high high intensity what has to be done in fact um that, that is sort of underpinning a lot of this in the background here um and that is part of the driver for court you know particularly why I look at some of those sensitive data environments is this this is kind of an emerging field of how this will actually operate and we're, we're doing some other work in the background to uh, sort of align some of those processes as well um so it'd be very nice to get that respectful sharing you know model that we got to yesterday um and changing some of that language but there is a, a lot of work going on on you know on in different parts of the uh, the overall community that's that's kind of driving this thanks Steve. Yep. Uh, I have another question from online. Oh, sorry. Um, it's from Julia, who asks, how long does it take if AIHW has to integrate their data first in your experience of such requests? Does that does this include access to ABS linked data under MyMAP? Oh, M M A D I P, sorry. Under MADIP. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um with ABS, we have to be very careful. So Specific data sets we can't access because they fall under the Census and Statistics Act, and ABS cannot give that data, even if they wanted to. Um, so we're working with ABS on what data sets we can bring in. In terms of the time, it's how long is a piece of string, unfortunately, when it comes to data integration, because it matters on what day, what measures you want, what level of data you want, what level of detail you want, unfortunately. Um, we had projects which took six months to get the data integrated first 
Um, and I'm still waiting with the ATO. Uh, we're still waiting for data. It's been two years now. <laughs> but mind you, that's not just access to data. That's that's separate to bring the data in to host it for everybody else. It's a bit different. Yeah, I just wanted to to add to Steve's comment. So, so the university accreditation process is is happening now. Um, I know certainly in the case of the group of eight universities uh, that they are working together um, around the accreditation and sharing um, information um, about how they're going. Uh, some of those institutions are at more mature stages in, in preparing their accreditation as users um, than others, but that information is being shared outside the GO8. Um, I'm not sure what's happening. Um, I would say if if, if you're a researcher in a university who wants to be able to take advantage of middle, um, one of the things to try to do is to make sure that your university is in the process of seeking accreditation as a, as a data user. Um, and for researchers to actually, I think, lobby uh, within their institutions for that to be happening if it's not. The other thing I think is really important um, is for people who have experience working with data like this in environments like this, that researchers actually feed into the accreditation process because there is a risk, in fact, that accreditation will sit um, within uh, IT departments or IT sort of central service divisions of universities and cybersecurity divisions. Um, and, and it's important, in fact, that, that it's also informed by the way in which research practice with these data and in these environments actually happens. Um, just to add to that, thanks, thanks a lot, Mark. Thanks, um, Steve, as well. Um, just to add to that, you know, so if the accreditation applies, if you're coming through Data Place, if you're coming through that platform, if you want to access um, data made available through that act and through that scheme, um, and there are ways you can access data without that environment. So as well, don't just that's not the only way. Yeah. One, two, and then we'll have to keep moving, unfortunately. Just on just on the point of uh, accreditation, indeed, the GO8s are talking to each other. Um, ARDC is also facilitating a national community, which all the universities are invited to. And I think at present there's 20 or more universities actually coming to these meetings. So um, there's, there's both happening. And we're also talking to the GO8s, and they're also in that meeting. So if you want to know more about the ARDC community, please, uh, please get in touch. So thanks. That was exactly what I was going to say. So, uh, yeah, please write to us on contact at ardc.edu.au and join our support group for those trying to become data place, data user accredited. accredited. <laughs> okay. Here you go, Ed. Anthony? Oh, <laughs> I can't. <laughs> I wanted that photo because, you know, you could mistake us as father and son, two handsome boxes. <laughs> you okay? Yeah. Thank you. Is that yours? Otherwise, I'll do your presentation again. Now, I'm mindful that we need to catch up on time here. So these, um, we've had a bit of a shuffle we're going to talk to uh, Ryan. This Ryan Perry is going to talk first. Um, so we've switched two presentations around. Now, Ryan, Ryan's, a, I'd like to say activist, but no, you're an archivist um, at ANU's Australian Data Archive, working with management of longitudinal data, data sets in the, in, the, in the archive and developing improved achieving process, archiving processes, including for handling deposits, privacy and risk assessment and archive, archival systems. Social psychologist with 10 years research experience across psychology, management, public health, including the ANU Centre of research, uh, Social Research and Methods, academic fellow at the University of Mel Melbourne, Department of Management and Marketing, and Mackenzie Research Fellow at the University of Melbourne School um, for Population Health. Ryan is presently working with Hass and IRDC team on the IRIS platform. Yeah? All acronym bad already. Yeah. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah. 
Thank you. Um, and first, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, Wurundjeri people, the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet today, uh, and where I live and work myself. Uh, and kia ora koto tanakwe. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to um, speak a little bit to um, the the processes um, that we use internally at the Australian Data Archive for uh, handling sensitive data. Um, and and you'll note there's there's a considerable bit of overlap here um, with what's happening in the the broader Iris project. Um, so uh, oh, and also, oh, I'm also going to detail um, some of the recent uh, scripts and apps that we've been working on, uh, working towards uh, self service um, uh, self service process for um, data owners that are interested in submitting their data to Australian Data Archive. Um, so uh, a little bit of overlap with um, Raj's slides. Uh, gladly, um, it's good to be on the same page. Um, really, all, all I'll add to that um, is to say um, uh, a critical part of the, the, def the Privacy Act um, for us is this um, idea that um, <clears throat> sensitive information is, uh, uh, sensitive data is um, defined as, as that with both um, identifying information uh, and sensitive information. Uh, and for much of the work that we're doing to uh, reduce identification, uh, reduce some uh, risks around sensitive data um, is targeted at the the uh, identifiable um, side of this. So it's it's more straightforward um, for us to uh, de-identify the data, um, uh, which um, you know uh, sometimes means uh, the sensitive data sensitive information is able to be published. But um, as was was clearly established yesterday, um, that's that's not always the case. So there's definitely some um, exceptions. Uh, that require more manual input from data owners and, and from the archivists. Um, uh, okay, so um, effectively, um, we are trying to balance um, access and, and utility in the data, so not um, not uh, changing it or, or or removing too much information. Um, but this, of course, has to be balanced against. Uh, privacy risks due to sensitivity and, and identifiability. Um, we can modify the data in, in various ways, um, but um, even so, uh, most um, sensitive data is, is published with conditional access. Um, and the um, I'll, I'll explain a, a little bit more about um, how we do that, I think. Um, uh, so, um, uh, much, much of the access is, is controlled um, manually at the um, data archive. So we have a, a team uh, who process um, each request for the data um, and um, and match up the, the credentials of the person applying for the data uh, with the customized um, access rules um, determined with um, the data owner's input. Uh, and our system also uh, in, ensures that there's detailed metadata attached um, to each of the um, each of the each of the data uh, deposits with us, uh, meaning that um, uh, that even if the information is is highly um, restricted or has a lot of access conditions, um, it's still very findable on our um, catalog system, um, so people can uh, find it, understand what's in there, and then uh, proceed with uh, with the access process. Um, all right, so so just in summary, we have um, two main strategies for uh, managing sensitive data in the uh, uh, archive. So there's the licensing and, and access conditions, um, which I was just talking a little bit about. So um, as well as the access conditions, we also uh, develop a customized um, data sharing agreement or, or license um, with the data owners. Um, um, and we, as archivists, we have a, a range of um, both automatic and, and manual risk assessment processes. Um, and I'm so uh, I'm mostly going to be uh, going through a few of these data risk assessment tools. Um, so we've been developing a, a suite of um, R-based um, scripts and apps, um, and these are working towards um, 
not only to make the process a little more a little easier um, and automated for the archivists, but we want this these also to become more of an educational tool um, for the research community um, and a means of uh, self-service um, data risk assessment and de-identification. <clears throat> um, okay, um, and as I've mentioned, um, so we have uh, access conditions and these also include uh, publishing different versions of the data. So we might um, publish both a, a general access with uh, low or um, low access conditions and a, and a restricted version, which um, requires uh, you know, uh, more criteria to gain access to the data. Um, uh, and we're also uh, gradually incorporating the, the five safes, which is a, a more formal framework for um, restricting access and ensuring that, that those applying for access are, are deemed safe people and their projects are safe and the settings in which they're using the data are safe. Um, okay, so on to um, uh, our, um, our scripts for um, assessing risk and de-identifying data. Um, so firstly, um, um, <coughs> Our, our first uh, script that we work with is um, is really just using a, a keyword um, search or key term search uh, of the data labels, so the variable labels and names, um, to uh, you know to identify um, common identifiers. So anything to do with names, addresses, uh, participant IDs. Um, so this is a good uh, sort of automatic um, check so that we don't miss anything, but uh, as you can probably imagine, it throws up a lot of false positives as well. Um, and we're also uh, trying to um, trying to identify uh, indirect identifiers. So these might include um, geospatial terms. Uh, so if there's um, geospatial information like postcodes, it's going to make the um, data riskier. Uh, the ability to identify individuals increases. Um, and I'll talk a little bit later about um, the the importance of um, of testing for uh, unique combinations of responses. So being able to identify someone by uh, combining um, you know, a, a range of different demographics that that uh, might be unique in that data. Um, as part of this, we're also uh, assessing the data quality, um, and I'll just mention briefly that. Um, uh, that we're automating it as, as much as possible, but the process still includes a lot of um, manual assessment from the archivists, including um, to evaluate um, sensitive information in the data, uh, qualitative responses, um, and, and other um, quality issues like uh, consistency in the naming and labeling. Okay, so this is um, just a screenshot of the um, output from that uh, that keyword um, script that I was just describing. Uh, so something really nice about using the R Markdown program is that the um, output of the script is a Word document um, that we can edit. Uh, you know, as we evaluate whether these are um, true positives or false positives uh, for privacy risks, um, and it's also a, a report that we can give to the data owners so that they can approve um, any suggestions. Um, so uh, you can see there. Um, so this is a this is a very risky data set, um, and you can see the the keywords that it's throwing up are, are things like name. Um, what's your name and I name and ID mostly there, and then you can see the um, the archivists' um, comments and the owners' responses um, at the on the side. Um, okay, so that uh, is that's how we uh, deal mostly with um, direct identifiers like names and IDs. Uh, it gets a little more complicated when we are assessing um, uh, the the combinations or the indirect identifiers um, that I mentioned before. Uh, so we have um, again in R using the um, Shiny package, um, we've developed a, a web app. Oh, well, it's in development. Um, <clears throat> where you can load in uh, uh, SPSS data um, and then um, choose various um, 
uh, variables from that to um, to examine uh, how many people have these these different combinations of demographics. Um, so in this example, you can see that um, there's a lot of um, relatively unique combinations. So we're interested in um, in combinations where there's uh, three or fewer um, respondents. Um, and you can kind of imagine from this data that if it was a if it was a single um, workplace or institution, uh, you probably could identify um, you know the eighteen and nineteen year olds that were in certain roles in your organization. There might be very few or only one of those. Um, so if there was also sensitive information in this data set, um, then you would be in trouble. Um, so uh, this is also, uh, as I said, meant eventually to be something of an educational tool. Um, so we're trying to make it uh, visually quite appealing with the, you know, the red highlights of when there's uh, potential issues. Um, and then there's a second uh, dialogue as part of the app here, um, showing you the, um, the frequency of each of the categories. Um, so uh, here you, you would be able to identify that, um, that some of your uh, more low frequency uh, um, occupation categories in there are so sales workers, machine operators, and the other category. And the app allows you to um, select uh, these categories that you, you want to combine together. So you might combine them all uh, into a, an other category um, so that they um, wouldn't be identifiable anymore. Uh, and once you've, uh, once you've made that combination, it, it does it to the data in the background, and then you can go back to your um, evaluation screen, and you can see that we've removed uh, almost all of the unique combinations there. Um, and in the background there, I've, I've combined the um, H into categories as well. Uh, and so from there, maybe you would want to um, combine your age groups to um, even broader categories to remove um, the remaining unique combinations. <clears throat> um, okay, and, and so one uh, final step. So we are expanding that work now to deal with um, risk associated with panel data. Um, and this is also uh, relevant to, um, to data linkage as well. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the more um, pieces of data uh, that you have um, across different data sets on the same person, the, the higher the risk of being able to identify them. Um, that you, so you might not notice in one wave of the data um, that there's a, uh, an identifiable person in that because, you know, in, in wave one, they gave more information or in another wave, they might have given sensitive information um, and you haven't sufficiently de-identified them in the wave you're working with. Um, so uh, what we do um, in these situations is, um, is first of all, limit the number of demographic variables um, and their categories. Um, so we, uh, working with the Life in Australia panel, we, um, only, we only publish the data with, with four key demographics and, and, and uh, recategorize those if there's lots of categories. Um, and this is really just to reduce the demands of the, um, the suppression that we're doing on the data. So if you have lots of variables and lots of categories, then you have to suppress lots of responses to make sure there's no unique ones anymore. Um, and so again, we're, uh, the, well, the, the um, R script is identifying um, uh, combinations with fewer than uh, three respondents or uh, three or fewer. Uh, and then it's it's suppressing those unique combinations by replacing one of the responses in those unique combinations. Um, so if you're the only person with a with a specific um, uh, education, age, uh, gender, and uh, um, job, uh, then the uh, algorithm will decide um, to replace one of your responses with missing data, so that you no longer have a unique combination of responses um, and I'll um, I'll try and explain as well how the how the algorithm is is determining uh, which response to suppress there 
Um, <clears throat> so this this took us a long time to get uh, it into a you know a, a coherent uh, paragraph. Um, so uh, so we suppress a given demographic value um, if the combination of the other three um, is more frequent than other combinations containing the given demographic. So um, so you might choose um, the person's uh, education response. So um, uh, if their um, age, gender, and job are a really common combination in the data, because that means their education uh, is the most uh, risky or the most likely to identify them because it's not as common when you combine it with everything else. <clears throat> Uh, all right, so just to um, uh, to leave you with um, the limitations of, of what we're working on here. Um, so, um, of course, focusing on the um, identifiable aspects of the data um, is not going to um, sufficiently uh, protect um, all sensitive data. Um, so um, as, as was established, uh, yesterday, um, the context um, and the, the cohort that you're working with um, is important because sometimes the even if it's not directly identifiable, the sensitive data still might, might not be appropriate for publishing. Um, so this requires um, a, a lot of uh, manual handling from the archivists and, and working closely with the data owners to establish like what, what's appropriate. Um, <clears throat> We, uh, with the apps, um, struggle to adapt to um, different uh, populations and uh, sampling um, uh, procedures. Right, so um, larger data sets are um, less risky, or if it's context specific, like my um, uh, single organization or institution example before, the risk um, increases. Um, <clears throat> Uh, likewise, um, we don't, uh, well, the, this side of the, um, the risk assessment and de-identification um, doesn't um, approach the research ethics and consent side, um, so that's also an, an avenue that we are trying to explore more is to ensure that um, data owners at the outset of their um, projects are um, you know, collecting consent appropriately. Thank you. Any quick questions? If you do, uh, hello. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Two. Sorry. I said quick. <laughs> <laughs> the um, do you see it problematic with Indigenous people? You know, um, when you you know. So anyhow, just sort of saying, do you see it problematic? Because sometimes, say, if we go, oh, how many Indigenous professors there are in Australia? We would know them all, basically. You know, something. I just, anyhow, I just put that yeah. to you, just saying, and say in the community, everyone know that maybe uncle or auntie is is the knowledge holder there, and to de and they have sensitive stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, anyhow, yeah, uh, yeah, it's it's a very good, very good point. Um, if you have, you know, very very few numbers of uh, certain demographics um, in your sample or in your population, um, then uh, you know, I think one of the main dangers from this is that you you end up um, removing them or or categorizing people um, into you know what what I called the other category before. Um, and the main way that we address this is is through the um, the access side. So we might, uh, you know, depending on what the data owner wanted, publish a, a general release um, that does have the data recategorized like that, um, but also publish a, a more restricted version um, for researchers that might want access to that more detailed information. Thanks, Ron. Okay, keep moving. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, in the interest of, uh, well, in the interest of saving time, I've got to shut up. But um, Jen, we'll proceed through, we'll go to Steve 
shortly. And then I'm going to make an executive decision and say we're going to only have 15 minutes for a little lunch. And then we've got to reconvene because then Levi starts after a uh, little lunch. So Steve McEachran. Well, I've been, you know, studying up. Steve um, is the director of Australian Data Archive, National, Australian National U University, where he's responsible for strategy and operations of the archive. Has been actively involved in development of application of data archiving and survey research methodology and technologies for over 20 years in Australian University sector. Steve has also had leadership roles, professional associations, data archiving and infrastructure, including chair of the executive committee of the data documentation initiative, treasurer, co-data, data, teach, a teaching Australian consortium of, for social political research, um, and international federation of data organizations. Now, when you finish, Stephen, We're figuring out um, structure on the fly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, when, always my approach. <laughs> and Jenny, look at me, look at me. Um, I'll get you to come up straight after Steve and we'll facilitate a conversation in the open discussion before little lunch. And we'll... It, yeah, but we might make up time if we need to. I, yeah, so, so we're figuring out a little bit on the fly. I have a real strong incentive for this. I've got to be on a plane at 12.15. So um, I'm very good at being able to keep things short. I have an incentive to, at least. Okay. Um, we've, we moved the order around a little bit because I thought actually Ryan's stuff would flow in nicely from what Raj was talking about. The, I mean, a, the, the I in IRIS, the integrated part of IRIS, and I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to talk a bit of, you know, quite a lot about that, is we actually have some quite good separated services in the social sciences um, that, that exist. The problem is the integration part. So um, how do we connect these things up? How do we make choices between systems? How do we uh, liaise between systems? So to, to a, a couple of the answers to the questions that were raised in the past two presentations was, this is not an either or. It's an and in, in almost every case. I could do this and I can do that. And pushing people through different systems and connecting between systems is really the, the big challenge we have here. And that's sort of the, the lead into my presentation as well, fundamentally, is how do we enable those connections effectively, it, progressively from manual to some sort of mixed automation and manual semi-automatic processes? So, you know, um, Ryan was talking about de-identification. Well, if I'm downloading the data, that's the thing I do. Or my alternative is to push it into Raj's system if it's got yeah, different risk. We do this in other places as well. And that's the sort of story we're going to talk about um, in this last presentation as well. So we're talking, I'm going to talk about metadata a lot, let's say, um, in, in this process. I'm also the reason for the, all the acronyms, to be fair, okay? So that's my fault. Um, that's because saying integrated research infrastructure for social science and the co you know, curation and research data services and social sciences just gets really long very quickly. I just need shortcuts. Um, okay. So I apologise for but don't apologise for it in, in a sense. Just as I say, you end up with too many words too quickly. Um, so we've, we've talked a bit, you know, talked about what is IRIS. But as I say, I want to talk, just touch on a couple of key points. And this comes from, from what we included in our original ideas. Quite good resources, but they're disconnected and they're fragmented. And that's, you know, really the story we're looking at here. And all the stories we've seen yesterday and, and, this, after, and this morning are really about either, you know, raising up the, you know, the capacity to connect to things or progressively, you know, joining, joining up that infrastructure fundamentally. Um, what we've been figuring out along the way, though, is actually that we need quite a lot more of things that allow machines to talk to each other. Fundamentally, it's the story that, you know, that we're increasingly finding. Um, so, you know, movement of information between systems. We actually have quite a lot of data, but getting to it, the access side, we do have this history of restricted access, uh, and that comes from the sorts of data that we tend to use. Um, but we also have this um, story of um, thinking about, you know, how, how to get to things and then how do we describe things. We describe things fairly well, but we, we don't reuse information, which allows us to connect systems. Okay, so let's say, I mean, that, so we had a couple of, you know, diagrams that we've sort of flashed up throughout. One, we've, we've tried to think about this in terms of a research process. So I'm just reiterating things here as we go through. 
The different work packages that we have within IRIS are really designed to you know, connect up different parts of the research process. That was That's one view of how we're thinking about things is what do you need to do in different parts of the, you know, uh, as you work through uh, research activities. So that's one framing we've got here is how do we make research easier fundamentally? Uh, and this, this was in uh, Raj's you know, document this morning. Uh, Michael nicely then talked about, actually, it's a combination of systems as well. So we need systems to talk to each other. So we have curation the cards, a vocabulary service, Vassal, geosocial is the integration services. And we are also interested in doing survey data, um, you know, managing of survey data, which is a, sort of a workhorse in you know, a lot of the quantitative social sciences, collecting and managing survey data. It has some parallels as well, with a lot of administrative data collection you might use in government administrative sources as well. We can use some of the, the, the same approaches as well, and then the demonstrator process, projects are the means for connecting those. Okay, so what's, I say, um, we knew this from very early on, but I say we would need quite a lot of, you know, mechanisms for connecting between systems. So really the first stages of what we've been doing is, is surfacing what those requirements fundamentally are. Um, so we need to create metadata. The data is there, but we have to be able to give it meaning and be able to get, let the machines to talk to each other. Humans can read, process and understand imprecise information. Machines can't. That's fundamentally the story that, you know, that, that we have. I mean, you know, that's, that's an obvious thing to say. But what it does actually mean is creation and curation or to, in order to effectively operate and interoperate these services is really a lot of the driver for sort of feeding through what, what we're doing. So we require systems that can create metadata at the point of creation. And that's a little bit of what I'll talk about now. A lot of the systems that we have now are producing information that allows us to do this if we can pass it to the next system and if we can reuse it. Uh, and or we might have to curate metadata and data as it passes through systems. And that was the sort of interesting thing that Ryan was talking about. And that essentially that Michael depends upon to run the geosocial system. So I'm revisiting from, from Michael's, you know, uh, uh, Michael's diagrams yesterday. We, we could see if we can find effective means for describing the data. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, that is essentially what metadata is. Um, and we can provide common vocabularies for the, the way we do it. We have things like Research Vocabularies Australia and a couple of other services we've been introducing as part of, our, part of IRIS as well. Then we have the basis for interoperating, but often these things are not there already. So either we want to say, we want to look at how we can make sure that they get carried through, or we have to think about doing it after the fact. So we, it's either at the time of creation or at the at, at, as the process develops. And different parts of our systems will, will need to do that. And we've just certainly been discovering in the last couple of weeks, been doing some work amongst the teams to say, well, what's kind of missing here? Uh, and so nicely sort of say that the Iron team have been working through a, a metadata model there. Uh, and, you know, it touched yesterday upon, well, what are those common sets? You know, the common standards, Nick was talking about common standards, really, standardized sort of content you know is the easiest thing to do or at least comparable content so um so for michael to operate the geosocial service he needs things that are essentially the same certainly to do the sort of the the, the computer you know uh, uh, mediated reasoning i said a human can do it but they have to do a lot of operations in the meantime the computer cannot do it until you give them sufficient information to do so. Now, I know we have ML and you know, AI site type models that are there, um, but there's only going to get so far. We still have to feed them. The, the, you know, we have to get away from the garbage inside of it in order to be able to do that. So what are the metadata requirements we're looking for? And this is you know, really the story of where, where we've come to. So the sort of things that we're trying to build through in our in the the work package five, which is the survey um, uh, data management, and work package six, which is the curation services, is a combination of you know, some basic requirements for metadata. We need some technical and semantic standards. We have to be able to say what a thing means, what is unemployment, what is education, uh, you know, uh, these sorts of things. To be able to say, if, I, if I've got a tabular data set, what is in this column? You know, I can say that you know, I can give it a name, I can give it a postcode, um, but if I don't have the, the semantic standard to say it's actually a postcode, I can probably figure it out if it's got four digits. But what happens if Excel decides to round it to three digits because it doesn't like leading zeros as an example? That's the sort of thing you kind of need to be able to do to let machines talk to each other. 
So I need this the technical and I need the semantic. What is you know um, you know two six zero one actually represent? Now that represents the the postcode for ANU uh, in this case, or three four three seven, which is you know Gisborne in Victoria, where I spent you know I lived for for some life. You know I know this and I can remember this. And, you know you need to be able to present that information effectively. You know, so what else do they need to be? It needs to be persistent. Can I reuse that from previous work? Um, I'm going to ask you to watch closely as I make my way through because I say I'm going to tell a story of what looks like persistence that actually isn't. You know, can I reuse something and you know and make use of it over and over? If I can build that chain of evidence, I can then say these things are linked to each other. It needs to be fine grained. Um, so, as I said, what's the name of this variable? What are the semantics of this variable become important there? Um, but we also need the coarse grained and Ryan and 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 Wojtek in the in the last few days have really touched upon this. I need the context to understand under which circumstances can I do something or not do something. Um, you know, Ryan was touching upon sort of populations and sampling, uh, as as was Wojtek. Do we need to de-identify something? Are you more likely to need to de-identify something that's taken from the census than than from a, a survey? And that's because. A survey samples people. You don't know that someone's going to be, a, you know, in a list, a population at list, a census, or the case that you were talking about, the Indigenous professors. You know who that list is, so you have to do different things. So you need the course and the fine. Okay, so we have nicely we have a, quite a lot of this um, in in a lot of the social science in, you know, infrastructure that we have. It's just disconnected and often using different sorts of standards. We do try and standardise some of this. This is an example of the International Social Survey Program, which I, I'm involved in the Australian um, arm of this. Um, we have the basic things that we can use to build this fine grained infrastructure. So we have a variable. A variable is a column in a, in a spreadsheet, fundamentally. We can give it a name. We can persist that information. And we can say, this is the variable that I used in my, my R script. So that's nice. But a variable in a survey, and this is you know, how do I reuse survey information, comes from a question. I ask a question of an individual. I might have done it. How many of you used Qualtrics um, in, in any that you've done? Okay, I can get that information out of Qualtrics and I can probably pass it to the next system, but I, I don't usually. But what if we could? Why don't we do that? That gives us this word starting to build that sort of provenance chain. That question is there. I also have a response domain. Here's the answer. So I have a question and an answer. And the difference between the question and the answer might actually inhibit or support interoperability. If I you reuse the same answers, essentially that's a vocabulary. If I reuse that vocabulary, I've got the same answer to the question. Um, so Mike, you know, uh, Ryan was talking about other categories. Who, who's in the other category? Or is that list of? Uh, do I have a pointer here? I'm not going to see it online anyway. The response domains can be reused nicely. This actually aligns pretty well with uh, lists that are in, uh, in, in other sources as well. What is your current employment situation? You know, in paid work, unemployed in education, that's something. Social sciences, we want to compare things pretty regularly. We reuse essentially the same, the same response categories over and over. And we even standardise them into national and international classifications. So our research processes support this. We generally reuse the things, but we don't persist them. And we don't always use exactly the same thing. So, okay. So we've got the pieces there. We even have a concept. This is essentially employment status. We give it a name, we give it a definition. Um, uh, but we might we say we've got to be consistent in our names and our definitions. And this is some of the hard part. Um, so, you know, how I define employment status, the ABS, there is an international classification. The unemployment statistics that appear in Australia every month are determined by an agreement in 1984 that flows through to the ABS. Uh, and, it, it, and there is very specific things that are there, but I might make it slightly different. Um, so we do have the pieces that we have there. And actually what we've been demonstrating in the work we've done so far is we can do a number of these things. We actually have been able to, in the, the process of been working, connecting a questionnaire and an archive, so getting stuff out of um, survey services uh, and into registry services, um, as say, is we, we say so far we've been able to get, you know, from uh, the, using standards, this is the means through which we're able to connect content up. So we've established a registry uh, based on a tool called Collectica and using two standards, the QuexML standard, which is used inside um, uh, for describing surveys and the DDI lifecycle um, standard, which is used for describing 
uh, data content in social surveys and, and related systems. We we're able to get content out of archives, again, using pretty standard systems, using SPSS, um, we could use Stata, SAS, things that are essentially on every laboratory desktop in every university in Australia to standardize things. They generally describe things in the same way. We can move them around. Less success with having classifications to vocab. So I talked about classifications. Let's say the ABS has a standard classification of occupations. It's got 6,000 categories in it. There's a classification of sex and gender uh, and gender roles, uh, not gender roles, um, sex and gender classification and a sex and gender standard. Those are less well presented. So the way in which they're presented matters. We can move things in and out, but they're not always available in effective ways. And they're not always exposed in effective ways. For those of us who use APIs, Turns out the API, we've been waiting for an API from ABS for 10 years. We hadn't got it. It turns out it was sitting there hiding behind the scenes, but you've still got to find ways of exposing it. But I say a lot of these depend upon, and this is the parts that we're increasingly having to do, export formats, use of standards, moot, how, you know, how are these things exposed by one system to pass it to the next system and the access points that are there, preferably APIs, but there are other models that are there. So we, we, we've been able to progressively build up, say, so we're, our, our pilots, we're getting, we managed to get things in and out of systems into an into a Collectica service here. Uh, so we've got this stood up as a, sort of a proof of concept. We've got three instruments. An instrument is a survey. A data file is an SPSS data file. We have a over a thousand variables. We can describe it, you know, 1700 columns of data. We've got 180 questions in our system. We've got pretty good metadata on the system. This was all generated already by the systems that we use to collect the data. We didn't do a whole lot of curation for these particular questions, but we would have to do this for the census questions. Um, we're able to say, here's the question. Sorry, that was the question in an instrument. Here's the questions that came before and after. Here's the full description of the question with some standard categories, the same questions I used before in my example. Uh, and then here is the variable that appears in the data set, which is the column of information the categories it uses. So say so we've got the pieces that are there, we can describe the content, uh, we can connect it up and we'll talk about the pieces that we want. So a third view of virus is to say, what are those you know, arrows from left to right? So we're progressively able to build up. This is, doesn't include the geosocial, uh, which would be you know, connected into some of these services as well. But we are yeah, been able to demonstrate through different means some of those pipelines and how they exist. And we're looking to progressively automate those. But we still need reuse in particular. Now, I talked about you know, persistence and reuse and sort of consistent use of information. And I kind of flicked over something quickly. Um, here's a question. It looks a lot like the question that I had there, had there before. So which of the following best describes your current situation? That was the same question sample I used before. Here's another question. Which of the following best describes your current employment situation? Are these the same thing? The answer is nearly. So one, to one talks about which of the following best describes your current situation, which of the following best describes your current employment situation. We're essentially asking the same thing and using very similar categories, but we don't use exactly the same thing. Uh, we do the human thing, which was we copy and then we modify. But the thing for us that we need to do next is connect those up. We want to reuse the same thing or where we change things, we want to be able to describe that we've changed. And that's the bit that we're going on to next. So the last, next parts we're going into a registry, the Collectica and the Research Vocabulary Australia to describe, to allow you to connect them back to a questionnaire, to reuse those questions. Those wordings were different and the, the response categories are different, which means they're not interoperable. Can we build that interoperability in as the next part of the work? Things like question libraries. We're looking at content reuse, exactly you know, that, that idea of reusing those questions you know, in effective ways, but also variables and classifications. Uh, and the likely solution, this is probably some sort of graph, you know, a linked data service plus a provenance model that goes with it. And that's really where we're moving into the next stages of work. So we have the pieces that are there. We're saying we're telling a story of interconnection, but progressively as we go through, we're starting to think about well, how do you actually make effective use of those? You know, we can move things from one system to the next, but how do I reuse the things once they're there back into the systems that I have? And that's kind of where we're going next. And that's our story. Any questions? Yeah. Hi, Steve. Um, can you, 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 you've mentioned or name dropped a vassal thing there. Yep. And you made a couple of points about you need better 
interaction between tools. Now, on the one end of Vassal, you've got the RBA system. Yep. You, you've done stuff to it to make it to make some content there more available for your tools. So what? Yeah. So this is a bit we're actually figuring out now is is actually what so what does so RBA is Research Vocabularies Australia it's an ARDC service what it does is make particularly good you know vocabularies of what it does best so in the in for the what we need to do things like a standard classification uh, or a list of response categories or what do you do best but it doesn't do the rest of those other pieces the question the variable and so forth it also is the case that and I you know that that last point of demonstration the, the answers that, that are used in a specific question might be slightly different uh, and it, it, it you know so we what we're looking at now is the interaction between the the standard here's this you know the, the list the, the pick list you, the things you can pick from and the specific ones that were actually used and what's the best place to locate those and we found that for we're doing some work with the census dictionary for example that it, it works well for the classifications and for the the, the standardized things but where we want to make modifications we've got a kind of look at where we host things locally or and how do we make those potentially reusable and probably putting them back into RVA is not the ideal case there. So that's kind of where we, again, this is this question of reusability. How do we present that back out and describe the line of, yeah, the sort of the provenance chain? Thanks, Steve. It's really interesting. Um, at this stage, do you have any idea of <clears throat> how researchers are going to interact with this? I'm thinking in my discipline, there's a great reluctance for one person writing a grammar to say, my past tense is exactly the same as your past tense. We can use the same category. So if you've got any kind of feedback. For it? Uh, so not yet. The, the the question really is, is can we say, because we know actually in certainly in, in this area, this is, is kind of how yeah, researchers work. It is an expectation that you reuse with a bit of, a little bit of, you know, it's the exactly as, yeah, so we got to say similar to as opposed to same as. Um, the you know, we do reuse a lot of content though, but we do it inherently. We say this is the, the measure that I used. Here's the questionnaire that I used. But we forget to act. We don't have the systems actually to say this is the relationship between those two things. Particularly classifications, we do want to use those because those are the things as that the you know the geosocial work was talking about yesterday. Those are the things that allow us to connect them up and and make those comparisons. But um, again, we might we make you know slight changes around the edges. Um, so I say there is a tradition of reuse. Um, I say with modification. I say so it's really that you know that where do those adaptations occur? But can we kind of describe that inheritance, which is what we expect? So the specifics of how that plays out for a researcher is probably in those question libraries that I mentioned. But you know, I say how do you describe what changes were made this is going to be an interesting question now i've got a request yep come in here yep i, I want you to say this very clear voice yes this is steve mckechran coming to you live from melbourne 3 aw oh. 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 oh my, my yes this is steve mckechran coming to you live from 3 aw <laughs> Oddly, that was my mother's favourite station growing up. There you go. But you've got a deadly radio voice. <laughs> and looks for it too. Yeah, I know that yeah. story. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much, Steve. And sorry I had to, you had to rush through that. But mm. then um, you've allowed us 15 minutes to have a conversation there, Jenny. Uh, <laughs> there you go. So... Yeah, I mean, I, I say you've kind of got a flavour of, of of where we've come to so far and the sorts of pieces that we're looking into there. Um, and we've talked a bit about, um, I say, this is kind of end of part one sort of, uh, sort of a discussion. We're looking to the future and saying, well, what else would you need to bring into the mix there? Um, uh, and what other, you know, what sorts of services, what sorts of infrastructure would be you know, sort of complementary to this that, that doesn't start to appear in this picture. Now, we, we, we've thought of some uh, things like, you know, how we support qualitative content, uh, so qual qualitative social research. Um, and we have colleagues uh, here at, here at um, Melbourne Uni who are working actively on some of that work as well. 
Similarly, and we're to say some of those in the room are involved in the conversation, things like new forms of, uh, of data, um, social media, uh, 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 Internet of Things type data. Uh, so we have colleagues, uh, Amanda, Michael, uh, uh, um, working on different parts of that, um, that thinking. Um, the third part that we've certainly thought about is, and this is a big driver for a lot of the, the sort of research that we, we tend to see is, is access to data that's not in the systems that we've just described. So particularly, and this, this was touched upon in some of the questions, um, the, uh, those linked data sets um, or other government collections that, that might be there. How do we enable access to those in an effective ways? So those are sort of initial things that we're thinking of that certainly you know extend the work that's there. But you know we're sort of wondering a little bit about what parts of the story haven't we got covered there, or does that start to tell part of the story for us? So I want to open up the floor to see you know sort of first reflections on there. What I mean, what are the other pieces there that you might you know be thinking? Of? And that includes, I say, we've got you know, a number of Indigenous colleagues here, um, certainly looking at Indigenous policy. We, we do see, see strong overlap, certainly you know occurring there. Um, uh, but, you know, other spaces as well that might be of interest um, for us to sort of explore as we go through. Nick, we've got Nick and uh, Sandra, yep. Hi, Steve. Um, a question about um, maybe stepping back mm -hmm. one and thinking about what kind of Governance long-term governance structures are, are around mm -hmm. defining the kinds of problems that these data sets and this activity are about solving mm -hmm. and who is at the table in terms of those decisions. And my question, because you, you, you know, mm -hmm. you're engaging a lot with ATO and powerful, well-funded organisations. Um, my question would be in regards to closing the gap priority area four, mm -hmm. uh, which is all about access to data. And I'm wondering what is the thinking around um, Indigenous led co-design around the problem definition about, and, and where is the space for um, the appropriate Indigenous bodies to be defining the data they want to see mm -hmm. and that reflects their needs and their requirements. And is, you know, where are we at in, the, in these conversations yep. with the government? I won't try and talk to where are we at with government. Um, I, I say, what I would say is this is what I think is one that, so to touch upon the, the Hassan Indigenous Commons more generally. This, this is one of the joint problems, I think, actually, is one of those shared, you know, shared parts of thinking that needs to occur for the Hass Commons. It's not specifically an IRIS problem. You know, we've got part of the story to talk to um, for particular types of processes and particular types of researchers, but governance more generally. And, and I would say reflecting up, you know, so I'm involved a bit in, you know, obviously, in IDN as well. Um, uh, but reflecting on some of the governance sort of questions that have been coming up, these are there are some indigenous specific questions that are relevant there. But actually, the governance process we're talking about here in related communities as well. So I've been, you know, I've done some work with the National Disability Data Asset, where similar sorts of stories actually started to, you know, start, started to come through in terms of thinking about ownership, governance, you know, rights to access certainly have come through in that sort of engagement as well. Um, so I would say, I think that is a collective um, requirement that we actually have across the Hass Commons, and I would extend that into a little bit of other places as well. Uh, things like the Health Commons, you know, uh, the People Commons, uh, that are likely to have those sorts of questions too. The other part, and, I, and, and the, the questions we got from Raj, uh, you know, for Raj's presentation kind of allude to this, is there is sort of a, a governance and, and a technology you know, discussion that needs to be, be thought about um, for, I'd say I really like the, t the term, you know, respectful sharing, you know, turning around that language towards how you manage some of what is essentially government-driven 
processes for access to their stuff for turning things around to actually i actually think though some of those models work for the other way around imagine if government actually had to ask the same sort of questions for access to your content as opposed to the other way around they're a consumer rather than a you know they're rather than a producer uh, of data so those sorts of models i think probably have some you know capacity use if we think about the uh, some of the the governance structures we can put in place um but that hasn't been that work hasn't been done yet uh, and I say, I think extending into, you know, other communities as well. I've done work with public housing communities with a disability data asset and the like. And I say the the sorts of questions that are asked and the sorts of considerations people are interested in uh, come through. The interesting part, I think, as, as we go through this is, uh, and the challenge that, 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 that has to be reconciled, um, is it's a story of, I want access to information about me. And that's good, you know, ownership and control over the information about me is good. The problem is I also want access to information about other people. And it's those other people, whoever they might be, who uh, say, have the same thing. They want information with access to their information, but it's that reconciliation of the collective and the individual, which is, you know, there's no answer to that, but how do you, you know, how do you put processes in place that actually allow you to reconcile those two things that, you know, um, that, that the parts we find out to work our way through. Hi again, Steve. Just before Sandra's question, you you said, how do we sort of integrate with other stuff? Mm -hmm. And I note that in the discussion thing here, it says future requirements for you know social science infrastructure. Um, I, I mentioned it uh, to do with modeling and so on yesterday, but um, there are lots of initiatives out there to do more with data mm -hmm. that's got nothing to do with social science mm -hmm. from their point of view, but from our point of view, yep. it does. And one example I'll use is we saw the um, the tooling about place names yesterday. So when Queensland and hopefully the national governments improve their place names models, that could have a positive impact on us. But in terms of what we should do to be on board with that is we need to actually come up with, even in concept, what we would like to see and then actually present that. So mm. when Queensland government says, look, we're actually rebuilding the place name system, they're doing it right now, mm. uh, we should go to them and say, Indigenous data network, the, the Hass community or whatever, this yes. is what we'd love to see. Now, they might, sometimes they're going to say, look, we can't do that. Uh, but for instance, if we just said, you know, that the government there would understand that dual naming or multiple naming with Indigenous names is a big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, but specifically how that's done, this community has got the contacts to Indigenous groups and so on that would actually be able to express their wishes. Yep. And as the mediators, people like me in the sort of the technical space between the communities and maybe in this case, the government, I uh, would want to interpret those wishes into an actual proposal because one of the things the government's not going to do is try and implement your intentions in their mm. model because that's risk for them mm. um, they're doing stuff for their purposes but we can probably often add on to that as long as we kind of guarantee we say if you represent indigenous naming in this way in your system we'd be happy with that they'll take that as that's great there's no risk for them they can go and do it it keeps us happy so my my um uh, i guess proposal here is to look at those other initiatives that are around um, and actually make concrete proposals to them, even if they're really basic starting ones that we think represent our community's interests. And, and this is an ongoing, I guess, advocacy task, um, mm. but just looking at the initiatives that are actually happening and then trying to jump in on them, I yep. think that's what we need to do. Yeah, I've, I've flicked, oh, it's disappeared off the screen. It's on my screen. It, it, could we pop? Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Um, I flicked back to this slide for, for to, in response to it. We, we, and our I say our, our thinking is exactly that, you know, as, as we know, there are some things that are happening in other, you know, in, you know, you, you're trying to pull together things from lots of different sources, generally speaking, and knowing about those, I sort of mentioned, you know, use of my standard, but that's never, you know, that's, you know, ideally, that's what I want, but that's actually not what happens. It's what I want is concorded or crosswalk, you know, to be able to connect. So uh, looking at you know, situations where I can reuse you know, and I know that I can, you know, use that information in my system become, is equally important. So, you know, sort of Michael's got this, to interoperate these things, you need to follow away all up the chain. Uh, but at this point here, things like um, provenance, uh, who hosts it, uh, what else have we got in there, collection methods and so forth. I say, it's probably the case that I can reuse those in, in pretty effective ways. So spatial, temporal, the other, the other is the kind of the social science, the terminology, the conceptual side, the spatial and the temporal should be able to reuse. And I think that holds in a lot of places as well. So as I said, you know, it's 
looking at common, you know, common practices and, and as you say, and feeding in this is our requirements there and be able to say, no, how do I how do I align those things effectively? I think is the kind of the model for doing that. And then be able to again follow that chain down. You know, can I say what the relationship or what the similarity or difference between these two things is, but not trying to do it all ourselves at the same time. We know as I say, we know there's a lot out there. We know that probably it's not going to be our us that does the, you know that work, but knowing that we can talk to it becomes a key part of that. Eric was over there. Yeah. Just uh, so thinking about the kind of data that we're producing from a range of projects at 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 six in Brisbane, um, we frequently don't use surveys mm. um, uh, because people want to yarn, yep. uh, and so you know we have these what we we call narrative assessment tools. So they're they're drawings that people collaboratively mm. do as part of an interview process. So, you know, in the course of asking a range of people about the same topic, we might get uh, an interview transcript, we'll get a drawing, we'll get notes from the person who was doing the interview. Um, so all, all of this and a recording of the interview frequently as well. So all, all of those things are the data. Hmm. Um, and I'm wondering if there's, there's a scope for a project that is looking at, okay, Indigenous people were designing a metadata system for this kind of data, which is frequent, you know, mm -hmm. ask a black fella um, about something, he'll tell you a story. So, you know, the the idea of, of narrative being the, the basis of the answer rather than a variable. Um, yep. Maybe there's, maybe there's scope for a, I, look, I, a metadata I think, project. Yeah, no, I think absolutely, again, there are, there are, this is why I get a little bit concerned about talking about my project as opposed to the House Commons as well, which is, I say, the I, I think absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll t there's sort of two sides to that. One is they're all just data, okay. So we've got to be able to store stuff. We've got to be able to talk to stuff. We've got to be able to you know figure out what what's there and and you know. So there actually aren't that many times. I think you know it's image as you say it's images, text, audio, video spreadsheets and then there's probably a little bit more Jason you know sort of the web you know the, the web data standards that, that are there and you've kind of got it covered so that you know be able to access those things is, is part of that then there's the semantics of what is there actually in the you know in the content that's there as well and how do I how does a particular domain or a particular group make use of that in effective ways how, how do I make that information you know accessible uh, and, and and surface it for a, what are going to be quite diverse a, you know um, research needs but might not be as diverse as actually you know we, we think that they might be so using natural language processing to go through and identify you know places in a in an interview transcript uh you know is one example that that might be there now i can see two immediate cases for that which is one is i can identify the place names which is great for being able to say something about place based you know uh, place based understandings the other application is i can de-identify the places which from the point of view of thinking about data security um, and and, and re-identification is, is, is an immediate you know, application of it as well. So I say, I think some of the, the services that we actually need are probably going to have multiple cases. It's how do we take that and be able to think about what are fairly common data types and data services and tools that we need and then apply them to particular methodologies, to particular domain traditions uh, and requirements that are specific to a particular you know, research community. Um, and that's, you know, so the, the things that we actually do in common, that's the, that's the commons, as it were. And I, say, and I so I think absolutely there's a, a capacity to be thinking about, you know, where we might use those. Same thing with images. We were working with images 10 years ago. We couldn't do this 10 years ago, which was where there was a colleague working on um, an Indigenous football competition um, out in, you know, uh, Western New South Wales. Could tell you where it was taken. Could tell you who, you know, um, what time it was taken, what size the file was, what the ge geographic location is. The thing I can tell you was what's in the photo. You know, you can do that now, of course, and that's great. But I can tell you who's in the photo, and that might not be great as well. Um, so, what again? How do we apply the technologies, particular techniques that that we're interested in there? So, I think absolutely that's going to be the case, and we can think about across the sorts of content that we have. And then think about well, for a given application, 
what's the you know what's the what's the needs we have there um but and they say we so we thought about certainly some of the access side of that in a related project that we're doing you now, what are you know, particularly between you know the qualitative social research traditions, you know, and and some you know the oral history traditions is probably a, not a big leap, you know. So there are certainly some requirements there. Uh, a quest, a comment from online from Julia for local problem solving and local solutions for communities that want to understand their local issues to find solutions. Only census or specific administrative data that is geocoded is useful unless those communities have resources for local surveys. This is a problem, as otherwise all these conversations are top down. Yes and no. So as I say, I, I made my start doing community surveys in particular parts of a local community. Yes, you need the resources to do those things. Um, but again, it's not an either or sort of question. Um, so be able to work downwards from those you know, large collections is important to provide some part of the equation. Um, being able to provide access to local, like I mean, say my, the work I was doing was training local people to do surveys of their own community with some with some supported resources, um, but those tools are becoming increasingly active. The the, the survey tools that I was discussing uh, are not free, but they're not expensive. They're again they're desktop tools at the university level. They're relatively cheap for a particular community. Survey monkeys, you know, Google Docs, uh, sorry, Google Forms can do these sorts of things. So the technology is getting less and less expensive than they were. The capability is different. Um, the, the yes side of that question is once you start getting to those low levels, that information starts becoming, again, we get back into confidential and privacy issues as well, um, uh, that, that become part of the equation too. So as I say, it's always this trade-off. Um, and there are, as I say, some really good work going in in certain Indigenous communities too, to think about how you do that. Uh, Yaru up in, uh, outside of Broome. Uh, for example, we've been doing work with Andalakwa um, uh, uh, just out uh, off Groot Island who are, are working on these in their communities to, to address it because sometimes the high-level data just isn't isn't worthwhile. Frankly, it's not sufficient. Um, and so you do want to do some local stuff. So again, it's, I, I think it's got to getting to an end rather than an all needs to continue to be part of that story. <laughs> we might kick them back in, I play. Oh. Shall we kick back in, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> We're still in the process of making up time. Um, hello, Annika. So Levi and Kristen, uh, Levi Murray and Dr. Kristen Smith are going to do their presentation on improving Indigenous research capability, stream one, social architecture. Now, Levi, are you related to Arnold? Yep. Bumper. Yeah. Yeah, him and I played football together. Yeah. Um, Levi is an Aboriginal man of Waka Waka and Cubby Cubby descent. Um, what am I? Le Sorry, Levi, they've gone Levi and then they've pronounced you Murray. Um, well, Levi is a Murray. Um, an expert on health strategist with over 16 years of cross-sector experience in health and education, worked as a dynamic range of in a dynamic range of primary healthcare settings throughout Australia, era, era medical, youth and adolescent forensic health, rural and remote health, health, aged care and disability. Committed to perpetual independence, growth, evolution of healthcare infrastructure for our First Nations people and their respective communities. Throughout the global COVID pandemic, Levi delivered senior clinical leadership and advocacy to Victoria's Aboriginal community controlled health sector and nationally as an executive manager of clinical excellence. Murray, Murray. Is it Levi or Murray? What's going on here? Hey? Yeah. I don't know what you were smoking when you put this together, uh, Jenny, but 
The expertise in both public population health was central to develop in developing COVID positive pathways for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and the co-development of new clinical models of care for COVID-19 vaccinations, pathology and diagnostics. April 22 was appointed a strategic manager of Indigenous data with the Indigenous Studies Unit at Melbourne School of Population and Global Health overseeing the HASP Research Data Commons and Indigenous Research Capability Program project. Murray will adjunctively co-continue to the relaunching of Oh my God, a Nadia, is it? And, and yeah, and you know what it is. And the development of their five year strategic plan. And Dr. Kristen Smith is a research director of the Indigenous Studies Unit in the Centre of Health Equity at the Melbourne School of Population and Global Health, at the University of Melbourne. Kristen holds a PhD in medical anthropology, a master in social science, international development from RMIT and a Bachelor of Arts with distinction from Deakin University. Her interdisciplinary work traverses the fields of medical anthropology, epi, epidemiology, epi, yeah, epidemiology, human geography, public health and health promotion. Kristen's unique contributions to health research include her innovative re work in Australian uh, Indigenous medical anthropology, policy analysis, data analysis, complex multidisciplinary theoretical and methodological, methodological development. And that'll do, I think. <laughs> Oh, yeah. So, Nara, one and all, my name is Levi. That was a very long winded, a very complicated <laughs> bio and intro. So, apologies for that. Um, I would like to pay my respect by acknowledging uh, the Wurundjeri peoples of whose uh, land and country that uh, we're joining from here today. I'd also like to extend that to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining both here in the room and those virtually. Um, and extend it also to the many partners and the many uh, communities in which we work with uh, throughout the multitude of programs and projects that we function within the Indigenous Studies Union. Thanks, Levi. So we're also going to give a bit of an overview of the Improving Indigenous Research Capabilities Project, as although a lot of the other projects have had quite good overviews and details, we're going to give a very brief update on some of the activities in the first part of the project and then following us, um, Sandra, Len and Nick will be talking about two of the other streams of work. So the project partners and like the other projects you've been hearing about over yesterday and today, we have a significant number of research partners, organisations, some of the key ones are named here, but there are a number of other organisations who we're working with as well. Um, again, this is just some of the key team project um, project team members. There are many more people working on different activities and sub activities around the project. This is just a representation of some of the key people working within this project. So just to give you a little bit of a background on, um, I, I guess, initially the Indigenous Data Network itself. So for many years, um, personally myself, I've been working with Professor Marcia Langton for a bit over a decade. So we've been working on a range of different um, research projects, both being anthropologists, mainly across the northern jurisdictions of Australia, from Cape York to the Northern Territory. And more recently, in the last four or five years, we've done a lot of work up in the East Kimberley, and we've started doing some more work um, in Central Australia across the MPY region. So I guess probably for quite some time during our research, we always work with community controlled organisations. And one of the key things that we always found frustrating and that the communities that we were working with found extraordinarily frustrating was the lack of access that they had to data. So when I'm talking about that, it's primarily we're thinking about government data assets that were about them, that often they are sending off data. So particularly if we're thinking about health services or any other range of services in different communities across Australia, yet they have very little access of that data coming back to them. And some, some organisations are working with this data very well and collecting their own data, but other organisations who have far less resources and capacity to work with that found it extraordinarily frustrating. 
So as I mean, a lot of the researchers in the room and listening in online would understand it, even for researchers in different fields, it's very difficult to get access to government data and government data that is meaningful for particular community groups for particular issues. So on the back of that, Marcia, in a lot of her working, um, decided with a group of us to put together a symposium looking at Indigenous data sovereignty. So that was back in 2017. We had about 200 delegates that we invited from all over Australia, from government, from the um, different peaks across Australia, from community controlled organisations, but also a series of different experts across the university sector um, in all majority of universities across Australia. So that symposium was co-hosted by IATSIS, um, the Australian National University and the University of Melbourne. And so one of the key, I guess, outputs from, from that symposium was the call for a develop, developing a network of interested parties in promoting Indigenous data sovereignty across Australia. So really that's where the Indigenous data network itself came from. So I guess fast forward to today, um, the IDN really is now a national network and it really aims to provide this collective base to support and drive better data outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across Australia. It's made up of a series of, you know, community controlled organisations. Um, there's Indigenous um, privately owned businesses. There's a lot of people in academics across the sector, predominantly Aboriginal um, academics, but also other non-Indigenous academics who are working in different areas that are focusing on ind Indigenous studies issues. Um, so one of the primary aims of the Indigenous Data Network is to support community controlled organisations to collect, manage and utilise data assets relevant to their needs and aspirations and to really think about how we can collectively promote Indigenous data empowerment. So some of the core issues that the Indigenous uh, um, Improving Indigenous Research Capability Project uh, um, Set out to, to answer and review is Indigenous research data. One of the things that we knew is that it exists uh, in a wide variety of formats um, and a, in a wide variety of uh, contexts, but these assets are ultimately scattered uh, and inadequately catalogued. Uh, there's many unidentified yet highly significant Indigenous data assets located uh, across the nation, which many are orphaned or held within five broad communities of Indigenous data research custodians thus including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and their organisations, universities, researchers and other organisations, the GLAM sector, which is galleries, libraries, archives and museums, Commonwealth, state, territory and local governments, and uh, the fifth one, the private sector. So as many people have already been talking about over the last day or so, what, what we do know is that, you know, many of these cust data custodians are, are really siloed, so there's not a great deal of integration between them. And they also have really widely varying data science practices and capabilities. And so we're not just talking about the community controlled sector, we're also talking about, you know, different data holdings within um, Commonwealth, state and territory and local governments. There will be different ways that data is managed, multiple systems, and it's really very complex for, you know, your average researcher, let alone, um, say, a data officer in a community controlled organisation to access. Um, also, there's there's really been an increasing need for a variety of solutions for data storage and management across all sectors and all of these different um, data custodians. So, for example, you know, some of the communities that we work with have really large holdings of data, whether that be video data, um, increasingly so, which is as we all know, really large files, that they're holding on hard drives, some of them in remote communities, and often in areas where they are really at risk of, of, of damage from whether it be during wet season, the cyclones coming through, or for fire. And for one, one community that we're working with, um, they really have little ability to upload it to the cloud because the lack of internet service or the limited internet service that they have in that location. So thinking through solutions for really varied problems such as this is, okay, so how do we get, you know, however many, well, a quarter of a, of a um, petabyte of data onto the cloud from a remote community? 
So, I mean, there are a number of different ways that you can go about that, but what actually is going to be the best solution for that community who is really concerned about ensuring the safety of that data, the, the longevity of that data, and ensuring that they safeguard particular elements of that data in the way that they culturally wish to either share or keep for themselves. So that's just one of multiple um, issues that are arising in different ways for communities across Australia. Um, there's also a number of, of different Indigenous data custodians who are calling for advice and practical solutions of how to actually embed Indigenous data governance and Indigenous data sovereignty principles. So at the Indigenous Data Network, and I know probably a lot of other organisations out there, we, it's a common request that we get from particularly government um, or government agencies of saying, okay, we're, we're custodians of all of this data. We want to implement Indigenous data governance principles. How do we do that? And so in this project, we're really wanting to think through some practical ways of different agencies and organisations and how they can start thinking through embedding these principles within their data holdings and in the way they collect, the way they analyse it, the way they share it. So across the entire data life cycle. Um, there is also, you know, a variety of other complex issues emerging regarding data access for Indigenous people, and that's already come up a couple of times across um, the last few days. People talking about, um, I guess, we'll go back again to government data custodians holding access to data, and often there's gatekeepers who do not provide access where access should be granted. So there's a, a seriously... Um, large problem looming there and how we deal with that is something that the, that this project is trying to start to build solutions for. So again, <clears throat> sorry. So again, some of the key questions addressed by the project is how do we embed and support and sustain Indigenous data governance across the Australian data in, uh, infrastructure? How might individuals, organisations and government use best practice models to ensure uh, good governance and what incentives might assist the prevention and use of data into the future? What types of authentication practices, processes embedded in IT infrastructures could appropriately protect data on behalf of individuals and their communities? What are practical ways to apply fair and care principles? Are there missing pieces to the puzzle that need further examination? How might we legislate, regulate data governance to benefit Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander data within the jurisdictions across Australia? And how can Indigenous data, um, data assets be improved by embedding Indigenous knowledges in new and innovative ways? So really, it's, it's we're not being ambitious at all in this project thinking we're going to solve all these things. Obviously, that's not what we're trying to do. So this project is about starting to build those foundations that nobody actually has the answers to any of these, particularly in an Australian context where there is such a wide variety of different needs and understandings and uses. So the project itself really is split into three streams of work, of which each of these streams have a series of, I guess, what you would like to call mini projects embedded within them. So the first stream, as you can see here, is the social architecture work. The second stream being the technical architecture work and the third being the building of national data assets. So of these three streams, um, they're really, we've designed them to collectively to lead to improved Indigenous research data practices across Australia. So although this project is relative, you know, when we were planning it, it's relatively short, so 18 months from start to finish, I, you know, I again, quite an ambitious um, task that we're embarking upon. We really see this as more of, you know, maybe a 10 to 20 year prospect of actually doing this properly. So what we're doing in this phase of the project is really trying to get some solid foundations to work forward in the future. So stream one, which we'll go into a little bit more detail as we go along, we'll just, we're just going to give a brief over, really brief overview of all of the three streams um, and the, the next presentation with our technical team are going to give more details about, about stream two and three. But Stream 1 really um, is made up of three sort of minor projects or activities. The first being um, a national scoping and engagement of Indigenous research communities and place-based application of Indigenous data governance principles. So that this activity of work is well underway. Um, 
it's consisting of a range of things, including we're doing a major literature review, a scoping review of both international and national literature relevant to Indigenous data governance. So also issues around Indigenous data sovereignty. That's been drafted at the end of um, this, this phase of the project. So end of June, we'll be producing a working paper, which outlines the findings of each of that, these activities and gives a bit of an overview of the work that we've done. Um, so activity 1.2, which we'll also talk to in a, in a bit more detail as we go along, um, we had a, a National Leaders of Indigenous Data Governance and Sovereignty Roundtable that we held precisely here in this room over two days in June, the 9th and 10th. So we'll give a little bit more information about some of the really fascinating sessions that were held there and discussions with a variety of different groups from across Australia. Um, there's also a link in, in one of our slides later. If you weren't there, if you're interested in catching up on that, the majority of the sessions we recorded on video are available to watch in the future. Um, so the third activity is actually one that's going to take us quite a lot longer than the 18 months to do, is looking at place-based case studies of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander data governance principles. So um, in this phase, the last 12 months of the, the project, we've been um, doing consultations with a range of different communities across Australia, trying to get a grasp of some of the key issues where different communities are doing very well at embedding Indigenous data governance into their practices and their work and looking also at some of the barriers and needs going forward. So we're, we're working at the moment with three communities, but it's going to, as, as we've all been talking about, again, over the last few days, this isn't a short-term process. Um, there is a high level of sensitivity around the data that's being collected by a lot of communities, and we've got to be respectful. It's not a quick process. So we're, we're making um, steps through that, and we, we do have a, a good deal of work yet to be done, but the start has been made on that as well. Talk briefly, just the overview of Stream 2. Yeah, no, it's fine. Um, so Stream 2, the technical architecture, like Kristen said, um, Nick and some of our partners will uh, do a demonstration and talk through that in a little bit more uh, depth. But a uh, brief overview is working to establish the foundations of an Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander research data commons, exploring repository services to ensure that the preservation of data assets catalogue services to make them discoverable in the metadata generation to improve asset description and facilitate data linkage and aggregation. So key activities, again, breaking down in there, there's three of them. Uh, 2.1 is the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, Research Data Engagement Scoping Activity. So that work's been currently underway. And what you'll notice about uh, a lot of the activities and a lot of the projects across uh, the three streams is that they are all interconnected. So um, one might precede the other, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that work stops at the at that point of the project. Uh, activity 2.2 is National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Research Data Catalogue. Uh, and activity 2.3 is the research data capability building for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations and researchers. So really wanting to understand and Again, one of our primary focuses is about improving that capacity, not just from a researcher perspective, but obviously from an operational and a workforce uh, perspective as well. So then just briefly, the third stream, so the, as you can note, there's three activities in each stream. Um, it really aims to build the foundations for a set of core national Indigenous data assets, focusing on the development of an Indigenous loci framework, which um, parallels the ABS hierarchy and can be applied to any data which includes location information. So as we've noted, more detail will be spoken about these two streams of work as we go along. Um, and just thing I want, one thing I wanted to note, so the activity 3.1, looking at vocab development and metadata labelling for um, traditional knowledge and biocultural labels, a little bit of, um, well, that has been worked on for the last 12 months, but some of the development work from the technical perspective, we have realised that that actually needs to go back up into the so social architecture, because although there's been a lot of international work and there's developing work in Australia, there's still a lot of governance issues that need to be worked through with that. Um, in the second quarter of this year, we will be convening um, an in-house workshop of a number of different um, stakeholders across Australia, specifically to look at TK and BC labels and notices and looking how they can practically be applied, but also thinking more broadly about um, how they can be usefully 
um, used in Australia and really looking at specific communities. Again, there is such a varied context across Australia, we can't assume that one size fits all. Um, so that will be happening in the second quarter of this year as well. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, as we mentioned last year in June, we convened a uh, round table and we had over 180 participants uh, come from around the country. Um, again, across uh, many different sectors, um, in, including the Aboriginal community control sector, um, three of our three of our research partners um, did present their, some of their key concerns and some of their key interests um, in, in the realms of data and research and also uh, of particular significance, um, data governance and data sovereignty uh, within the context of uh, First Peoples. So the Indigenous Data Roundtable uh, provided a forum for all of those attendees to collaboratively explore and discuss those practical solutions, key barriers and models of governance for a shared benefit. Uh, the presenters and attendees discussed and shared international best practice data science, data governance and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander knowledges and worldviews. So just to give you a better understanding of the key sessions and some of the issues raised, as I said, here's the link to the Vimeo if you want to go and actually look at those sessions um, yourselves. We also published in The Pursuit, which is the university's um, monthly magazine online. We've got an article in there that we wrote after this symposium, sort of highlighting some of the key issues. I should have given you the link, but we can send it through if you want to send us an email. Um, so... For that, the first session was looking at um, Indigenous data governance and sovereignty in action in a community controlled organisation. So that was a fabulous presentation by um, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Community Health Service. So three of um, the, the people at, at that health service. So there was Raymond Brunker, um, Jared Allickson and Jonathan Leach um, gave a really good presentation of the journey that they've been on. Um, working substantively um, with QUT, um, Becky Cook over here and a few other people have been really involved in that work. Um, and I'm just trying to see where John Willis is He's around here somewhere. John could talk to us uh, extensively about that, that as well. But if you want to have a look at that session, it's really interesting the journey that they have gone on um, to try and start working with their data, utilising it in particular ways and the way that they are managing it. And look, it's a really interesting and I guess I would say Australian um, best practice example of what to look for in um, Indigenous data governance and sovereignty practice across Australia. Um, and then next up, we had um, the Indigenous data sovereignty into Indigenous data, uh, Indigenous data governance into Indigenous data sovereignty presentation from the Mayam Nairi Wingara Collective, which was a series of three um, really interesting um, presentations from members of that group. Um, it was then followed on by uh, the National Indigenous Data Catalogue and Practical Applications of Indigenous Data Governance by members of our project team. So uh, Sandra and Len and Nick um, were, gave that presentation. We also had a session on uh, tra the traditional knowledge and biocultural labels from Stephanie Von Gavel at CSIRO and Professor Rachel Ankeny from the University of Adelaide. Is Rachel here today? No. Um, so they gave a really interesting update on the work that they're doing going forward and some of the key issues that they were coming across. Um, we also had a, a, a session on co-designing an Indigenous data roadmap and building capability by Professor Peter Anderson, Professor Matt Belgard, and Professor uh, Professor Kerry Mingerson and Becky Cook, who I've already pointed out over here um, from QUT. Um, following that, we had a session on working with international standards, the European Data Protection um, Act. So that was from Dr. Chris Wilson, who is an expert in the area, um, has done his PhD in cybersecurity over there and gave a really fascinating talk looking at how, um, I guess, what is happening in Europe, we really should be thinking about significantly in Australia to improve the way we deal with some of these issues. Um, following that, we had a fascinating um, a talk from Michael Ed at the University of Queensland from the Anthropology Museum, who Jenny already referred to yesterday, starting to think through some of the ways that, I guess, as I mentioned before, some of the gatekeeping occurs around materials, data and objects. So Michael went through a whole series of ways where, I guess, gatekeepers were keeping Indigenous people out from accessing 
in particular photographs of their ancestors. So if, if you're interested in checking that out, that also that session is online. I would highly recommend it. Um, following that, we had a presentation from Steve McEachern, who has left the building now, um, but he was talking about starting to think through some of the federated um, data models that could be really useful when thinking through data holdings for Indigenous, um, Indigenous data per se. So as I've already mentioned, a lot of the, the communities who hold their own data really don't want it open for everyone. So thinking at least how can we make data findable? So the catalogue, te the team who've been working on the catalogue will talk about that in a little more detail. Um, then following that, it was another great session I'd highly recommend checking out if you weren't there, um, that was delivered by Empowered Communities and um, a member of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Community Health Services, looking specifically and, and talking about the data that the, the communities need, so their communities themselves. Um, calling out, I guess, to governments that they've been looking for access to data for a very long time. And I mean, I guess there's the side issue with that that has been happening with the new legislation that came through last year and the data code, so the Data Transparency and Availability Act. Um, from the IDN's perspective, we've got significant concerns about the further barriers potentially that they that will put in place for communities trying to access their own data. So uh, Levi, do you want to tell, talk a little bit about some of the conversations and the groups that you've been involved with yeah. in that context? Yeah, so <clears throat> part of that work of, um, I've been sitting on uh, the Deputy Secretary's uh, Data Champions Working Group. So the Australian public sector is currently uh, moving towards developing, designing a framework and how it is that they actually manage uh, those holdings, particularly those of Indigenous uh, peoples um, with data sovereignty and governance embedded throughout every every part of that, the data life cycle from creation, uh, from conception to creation and all the way through to management. Um, like Kristen was saying, with obviously the introduction of the Data Act and that passing through, um, one of our main concerns is the, uh, I guess, the the potential for that to bottleneck uh, information and put a further strangulation for community to be able to really access critical information and to be able to uh, make determination and uh, do decision making and all that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, we've been largely advocating around that. And so that works progressive and ongoing. And um, so we'll continue that work as part of an advisory group um, over the coming year. But I guess one of the other things that we're doing is we've essentially focused on improving uh, research capability. <clears throat> and there was a lot of conversation yesterday um, around like research. And I guess that's what everyone's here, essentially here for today. Uh, I will kind of uh, go off on a tangent here. But I, I did want to make a few comments about yesterday. When we're talking about research, um, language matters. And I think all the way through yesterday, I found it really interesting. We we, we definitely do identify like researchers as a uh, very particular cohort within our community and throughout our uh, society as a whole. But, you know, at the end of the day, people, like everyone's people. <laughs> and, you know, as human beings, we're born with a very innate sense of um, ability to, you know, functionally uh, filter through data like our whole world is built up on data. Everything is about that. Um, and so what, when we're looking at, you know, indigenous data governance, sovereignty, when we talk about um, long-term infrastructure and, you know, reform and all of these things that um, are high priorities and concerns for us all, we can't have that without changing the language at the same time. So, you know, uh, when we talk about research community, that in itself is exclusive for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. It ignores the fact that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, their knowledges, their practices, culture, laws, um, far exceed any of the research in more contemporary times, because it really is, you know, a couple of hundred years is very contemporary. So um, one of the things that we're also doing uh, at the moment is developing uh, further training and trying to roll that out low cost and, you know, ultimately free. Um, we are participating as well next week in the ARDC Summer Skills School, 
Um, as Jenny mentioned, there's been a specific part that we've designed for Aboriginal community control. And so the idea there is to basically change the language and we want to be able to create space and opportunity uh, for, for them to come into that and ensure them that they have a seat at the table. Because even now, when we're talking about innovation and everything, there's not really a clear idea of where people sit, particularly Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So, yeah. Thanks, Levi. And really, that's that's the main part of our talk today. We tried to keep it short. I just, I guess, in in concluding, look, as I said initially, we really ju just are at the start of a really long term process. We're going to be planning out, and I guess learning from our findings, thinking about, okay, what's going to happen in the next year? What's going to happen in the next five years and beyond that? And ultimately, this is a collective project. It can't be something that's just done by one group or one organisation or one discipline if we're thinking about research. It really has to be a collaborative effort across Australia. So if anyone wants to be, is interested in being involved, please do reach out. Um, we're based um, administratively in the Indigenous Studies Unit, which is actually now not the Centre for Health Equity, we're the NEMDA Centre for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health and Wellbeing um, that was launched Tuesday. <laughs> Um, again, here in this room, but please do reach out. We're really interested in hearing um, about different ideas from different people across Australia. Because, as I said, it really has to be that collective effort. So, thank you very much. Any questions? Oh, any questions? Does, does um, your act accessing information and does it allow for? Um, a recognition of kinship decision making, as in not one person holds all the story. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's very much part of the whole work of. No, it's a very good question, and I think that's very much centered around like the that exploratory part of it is understanding the the incredibly um the incredibly, I guess, nuanced uh, elements of not just governance, but also policy and also um, respect and rationality as well. So, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Hi. Thank you. Um, my question's about something that Levi said was around the data champions, the DEPSEX data champions. Forgive me because I know nothing about it but I'd love you just to say you talked about you, you sitting on that around that table and what their kind of agenda is and does it include you know the entire public service or are they sort of select departments it'd be interesting to know what that forum is doing yeah so I'm sitting on that um, I'm sitting on the working group of that so Professor Langton sits in the actual uh, uh, committee above and the working group is actually sitting there and it's got a quorum of um, equal Indigenous um, uh, participants and non from the APS sector, uh, central focus on looking at reforming. So the framework, uh, the framework that they're wanting to introduce in is theoretical, but again, that'll probably, they're wanting to introduce that over a two to three year period. So that is currently being socialized in March. And then so if approved and that, that's moved in, that ultimately it'll probably start at a very smaller portion of the APS. Um, of particular interest, it'll probably be the likes of Australian uh, Institute of Health and Welfare, um, land, water, and environment, some of those, the, the more central pressed ones and the ones that have been identified as priority areas from Aboriginal and Torres Strait people. Does that answer your question enough or, yeah. Are you guys having any, um, I won't say blockades, but have you got, are you having trouble with any communities? I know you guys are trying to do more on ground and in community talks. Are you having any communities and or elders that are refusing to want to give that information because they want to keep it within community or within just their section of culture? Um, and if so, have you got strategies around that? Are they working? Well, we're not necessarily going out to seek people's data. It's really more about supporting them to use data, different groups to use data in whatever way that they want to do. 
I mean, if, for example, there is need for um, repositories, which we're hearing a lot, we will be in that role of trying to support and think through best case solutions and scenarios for each individual group. But a lot of this, I think, in this particular initial work is starting to find out what are some of the variety of issues that different community groups are having. So we're not having any specific issues in getting access to whether it be data or communities. We work with a, a broad range of communities across Australia through a lot of our research work through the IDN and other work that we're doing. But it's more about starting to document some of the different challenges different groups are having. Yeah. Is that is that? Yeah, yeah. and I guess to kind of further add on to that, one of the things is is we haven't actually kind of set those priorities. And so everything that the IDN has done has ultimately come from, you know, very considered uh, uh, consultation over a very prolific period of time. We're talking over the space of a decade, right? And so I think like, you know, thus far into this project and where we're currently at, we've not experienced like, you know, I, I guess any sort of kickback or that because ultimately we're not determining that, right? So what we're actually doing is asking what is the priority? So it is very explorative. And I think in that space, um, it's very, uh, I think it's a really kind space. So what we're being met with is not just uh, really good reciprocity from community, particularly um, key people of interest and elders and uh, any of those uh, stakeholders. Um, yeah, we, we, it's it's actually quite the opposite. We've, we can't actually uh, keep up with the demand <laughs> of it and the engagement from people, which is good, right? It's a really good, it's a really good problem to have. So, hello, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I had a question. You talked about um, uh, one of your projects wanted to implement indigenous data governance. I was uh, wondering how does that look in practice, or is is the work you're doing trying to understand what it means or yeah how would you interpret that yeah no, that, that is a fair question um yeah wouldn't we all like to know but i guess that's that that's it so one of the things is understanding that right and, and i guess it's been mentioned throughout the last two days just how incredibly nuanced but also very idiosyncratic right um, would like to reiterate the point that Uncle Graham made. It's just like every single Aboriginal community might have reoccurring themes, reoccurring like priorities and whatnot. But ultimately, each of those communities, what happens and occurs in there, those events are distinctly theirs. And I guess the solutions in the way that they have not, not, not only done governance for millennia, but how they envision doing governance into the future is yet to be determined and to be understood so super explorative and i guess also the next presentation will be talking a little bit about how they have created some tooling around the care principles that i'm sure everyone will be quite interested in so uh, coming up next <laughs> just trying to google united nation governance principles they would be something too that you would apply um, and I think from memory, they are consensus oriented, participatory, making sure that minority voices in the context of a group of Aboriginal people, so that all the voices are heard. Um, and the other thing is that the complex, like in a, in a Western project management um, context, they talk about scope, time, quality, cost, um, risk as an example and then the, the concept of aboriginal time versus western time and all that sort of stuff the same things have got to apply when you apply western governance into a trauma traumatized space that sort of stuff which is what you're across anyway but you're across it but the others do have to do it as well thank you very much that was uh, no other questions thank you now look at Look at Sandra sitting there all champing at the bit, ready to go. I haven't had any dairy since you talked, spoke to me this morning. Um, so you're going to take us through with um, Sandra, Silcott, Len Smith, Harrison Ford, and Nicholas Carr. Um, so Sandra, as you come up, I'll just give you a bit of a rundown. Um, Silcott, member of the IDN Technical Reference Group, experienced, talented, practical ICT professional supported the development of major IDN projects, Indigenous research capability, 
funded by ARDC, Centre brings experience in identifying users' needs in the context of implementing agreed solutions and empowering colleagues. Employed a skill set including systems administration, database development, and data conversation on large research projects, including ARC founders and survivors project. Dr. Len Smith, Aka Harrison Ford, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, what was the other one you were in? Um, the, the space one, Star Wars. Um, now, Dr. Len Smith, lead, lead of the IDN technical reference group is nationally and internationally renowned demo, demographer with an extensive background of research focusing on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Dr. Smith was able to reconstitute the Aboriginal population that was not recorded in the protection board records and demonstrate how the Victorian Aboriginal community recovered to reach its current strength of over 30,000 people who identified the last Commonwealth Census. Dr. Smith is also a member of the IDN Steering Committee. Now, Dr. Nicholas Carr, that's you. Is it Carr? Yeah. You can say that. That, that works in English. Yeah, but what is it? Well, like many people here, it just comes from a different cultural background. So, so it's yeah. <laughs> Nicholas Tsar. That's better. Couple of days, that's the matter. Nicholas is internationally recognized as a thought leader and expert in data architecture, data systems design, link data, semantics, semantics technologies, design uh, was design lead for nationally significant and innovative link data and semantic web projects, including location index, longitudinal spine of government functions. Also outstanding academic achievements, including PhD engineering from University of Melbourne, Bachelor of Engineering Honours for University of Sydney. Active as standards editor, W3C's data, data set exchange working group and open geo, geospatial consortiums, geospatial standard working group. And I'll leave it at that. Who's first? Who's hand up? Well, you look like you're the most important outside. No, uh, thanks, Grant. I'll do a quick introduction. Uh, well, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and the lands on which uh, people are uh, coming into us from remote locations, uh, and also acknowledge the traditional owners of all the unceded land around this nation and acknowledge the fact that we see solutions to that lack of seating through the process of treaty voice and truth telling, uh, which we hope is uh, soon to be embarked on. Like also to uh, convey apologies from our colleague and leader Sam Provost, who's had to go home for sad family reasons. Uh, uh, we'll try to fill in uh, the gap that he left. So, uh, Nick, I think uh, we'll pass it over to you to start talking about our technical stuff. Hi, everyone. And apparently 20 minutes ago, all the state and territory ministers, uh, chief ministers and the prime minister signed on to an in statement intent about the voice. So things are moving there. Um, so this is about the streams two and three, as, as mentioned in the previous talk. Everything we do is suffused with issues to do with governance and engagement. But luckily, day to day, that's not what we're doing here. Uh, we are dependent on relations to community and so on from the wider IDN. But day to day, we're doing the technical work of implementing systems and models and things like that. Um, but I hope throughout the presentation to indicate where the governance stuff comes in and the relations come in. And I'll pass to Len and Sandra to get me out of hot water every now and then. OK, so very briefly, um, we're going to overview our technical approach and in fact, it occurs to us, uh, looking at our slides, that we're going to do a less technical presentation than some of the other ones you've seen in the last couple of days. So that's good. Um, uh, we're going to talk about uh, our data integration framework concepts very briefly. Um, and then we're going to go through the actual progress report of where this part of the Indigenous Data Network work is up to. So that's the Indigenous Data Catalog Project progress. We're going to talk very briefly about Sam's ANU case study, and we're going to quickly mention at least some of our plans for the future. Now, uh, part of the work that we're doing is about 
putting more of our information in more accessible and, um, and readable forms. Um, so a lot of the stuff that's presented here today in our work will end up on the Indigenous Data Catalogue Project website. Um, and what we're aiming for there is to present not the stuff that we've done, sort of, you know, we did A, B and C, but more, you know, you may have heard of us from, and this is what you might be interested, kind of think things that we expect and hope people will ask as questions. And then the way we answer that will be sort of, you know, indifferent. Sometimes they'll say, how do we, how do I make a catalog for my orphan indigenous data? We might have a thing about that, but we're going to try and work out the big questions that, um, that people have of us um, and then sort of place those in there. It's very hard to read on there, but, you know, finding indigenous data, characterizing indigenous data, et cetera, et cetera. We're not quite ready yet, but should be soon. Okay, so the overall technical approach. And I think I've, now, Jenny, um, I think we might have dropped a slide in there somewhere. I think there's something missing. But anyway, I'll, we'll survive. Is, is, it, is this, an, this is an online one. Anyway, anyway, we'll, we'll survive. Okay, so one thing that we're doing, a, a general approach that applies to both the cataloging component that we're working on and the handling orphan data is to make implicit knowledge explicit. So imagine that you've got a table of information. Um, you know, it could be statistics or who knows what. Um, sometimes you have implicit information needed to understand that table of data. And part of the mechanisms that we use and the style of data that we handle calls out those relations. So in that first row, there's three cells there and there's relations between them. And we're actually describing those in a particular way, in a technical way, uh, but we're taking implicit researcher and hopefully indigenous knowledge and making it explicit. That's part of the preservation process of that information. And it makes it... Um, uh, on the surface easier to understand. Uh, we're directly reusing defined concepts, and this is where I'm happy that Steve and others have done a technical presentation before us. Steve talked about vocabularies and those sorts of things. So where those exist, we're employing those. They don't exist for everything, so we have to define th some things that are of interest to us that don't have definitions elsewhere. And this comes down to roles and responsibilities, information from the Indigenous community that hasn't yet been represented in forms that machines can read and so on. That's part of what we're doing. Okay. Um, and the last point here is that, yes, uh, we are cataloging things and we're calculating things. We are actually giving the, the score of certain things a go. We're trying to score things. We're trying to implement fair and care scores. Are we going to get it right? Eventually. Obviously not straight away. This is difficult stuff. Uh, we'll give it a go and we'll see how we go. But without metrics, government really doesn't respond very nicely. So we do sometimes have to calculate these things. Okay. Now, our general data integration framework looks a bit like this. We may have a block of Indigenous census data and we can do the sorts of uh, things that best practice would have you do regarding that data, defining the questions, defining the metrics and so on. Uh, but for wider integration, it's very important that we define the reference data around that. And again, as Steve mentioned in the previous presentation, um, use reference data that other people have access to, like vocabularies, models, etc., cetera, um, so that we can join our data to other people's data. How does this occur? Well, the places that we use, and, and um, Kristen mentioned that one of our charges is to develop um, places of uh, importance and utility to Indigenous data. Um, and if we had our data referenced against such places, we might be able to spatially integrate those places with non-Indigenous data, such as Australian statistical geographies, natural resource areas, etc. So this is a well-known type of thing, uh, but just going back a slide, actually, we're not just talking about the places, we're talking about the methods that are used, the observed properties, the agents, that's people and organisations, a whole range of different parts of the data that we want to set up as reference data sets to now allow us to join our data to other data. So here's another one, uh, the observed properties, the stuff that we're actually, or the dimensions, as statisticians would have them, the dimensions that we're using, they might be custom in our domain, they might be, you know, um, uh, something to do with Indigenous identity, which isn't present in normal census data or isn't present in non-Indigenous um, statistics, but we want um, the, the dimensions of our data to be available for reuse, and also we want to join where we do have data in common with non-Indigenous stuff. We want, we want to join on those points. And then finally, what does this let us do? Well, it allows us to join our data through reference data sets, which may be vocabularies, but they might be very big, complex things like enormous databases of spatial information. 
um, we can join our data to other data. Okay, so that was the kind of conceptual sort of where we're at. Now, specific um, progress in the cataloging uh, project that we're involved in. I'm going to talk very briefly about the um, the catalog standard profile that we've been implementing, some vocabularies, an agent's database that we're building, reference spatial data set scoring, and then not number six. I've talked a little bit about number six already. Okay. Now, I'm not expecting you all to be able to read and take in all of that, uh, but what that picture is showing is that in our catalog profile, and, and what we mean by that is there are standard mechanisms to catalog data out there, and we have specialized one of those mechanisms to specially cater for Indigenous concerns, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, but in doing this, we haven't just written down a standard or a, a variant of a standard. We've provided a whole pile of resources to help people use our specialized version of this, including things like mappings from our system to schema.org, which can be used with RO crates. Um, mappings from what we're doing to the Commonwealth's 26 data elements that they want to collect and things like that. So there's a whole pile of resources. Some of those resources are definitional. Some of them are guides. Some of them are software tools, but they all together make a bundle of tooling uh, and, and bits and pieces which help you with uh, this catalog profile. And the profile is used to characterize data out there. If you've got a data set and it's indigenous and you want to characterize that indigenousness, um, this is our proposal to do that using mostly a normal cataloging model, but with extensions. This model has a formal backing. It's not just a loosely defined thing in a Word document. Take note, Prime Minister and Cabinet. Uh, this is, in fact, a formal model that we've mostly inherited from other standards and then slightly extended. Again, you don't really need to see the details, but what you're seeing there is a formal diagram and all of the documents and tooling and everything that we've provided as part of our profile is derived from this formal model. And the formal model has calculable ends. So we can uh, we can uh, use that model to uh, and test whether certain data according to that model will or won't answer certain questions. Some of the tooling that's part of the profile is a, uh, a, well, one of the tools is a metadata creation tool. So there are lots of tools to create the metadata. We've seen Describer and others for RO crates information. This tool is tuned to create metadata for uh, the representation of indigenousness or indigeneity. Now, we don't expect people to sit around all day and using this tool. We're not asking people out there, if you've got 10,000 data sets, to type them all through this tool. But the tool is there to check uh, if I do have a data set and I put the information here, what does that look like? What scores do I get for that? It's a testing tool. It tests the model. And it is there for the creation of new metadata if that's what you want to do. But in most cases, what we're hoping to do is to find data that's already uh, already um, described and to uh, interpret that description in, in, the, in the form of our profile. But nevertheless, there is a tool. It's online and you can have a go with that tool. Now, behind that tool... And behind our integrated data generally are a series of vocabularies. Um, as Steve had mentioned, you need these vocabularies to be certain about values that you're applying to things. Some of the, voca the, 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 um, the, the vocabularies are what you'd expect, you know, um, uh, uh, the indigeneity of data. And by the way, we, ha we haven't made most of these up. We've mostly taken them from, from literature and elsewhere. But, you know, the way in which data is indigenous, for instance, that is a, a vocabulary that exists in literature, and we've pinched that. But there are some surprising ones in there, things like the, the roles of catalogues with respect to data. This is not an indigenous concern. This is a universal concern. I've got a thing. It's in a catalog. What is the role of that catalog with respect to this? Is it the first place this was ever published? Is it a harvested version? Is it the primary, etc.? Those are normal cataloging concerns, which this project has brought to the fore. And we are trying to solve those problems, those representation issues, and hope to push that information back from the Indigenous data network to non-Indigenous cataloging systems. Uh, so that is a benefit that non-Indigenous people will get from this Indigenous work. Um, and that's because there are certain issues to do with um, uh, authority and governance that we can't answer about data unless we know where it was first catalogued and when. Um, and uh, for the Indigenous purposes, that, that uh, the system is required, but it does also solve non-Indigenous issues. Another major part of our cataloging project that we didn't fully anticipate when we started, but we do now, is the, uh, the need to have 
a listing of agents. So these are people and organizations that have a role with respect to data, indigenous data. Um, we need a collection and a, a list of, of those agents uh, with notes from the indigenous community on them as to what exactly those agents are doing. So I'll give you an example. The Australian Bureau of Statistics. Uh, to our way of characterization, that is a data holder. It holds indigenous data. It's a non-indigenous led organization. I think that's pretty uncontroversial. Um, and um, and uh, so that's in our database. Now, certain community indigenous groups, they may hold data. They would have a very different kind of role with respect to data, especially their own data than the ABS would. So we want to characterize, we don't want to characterize, we want to provide the facility for communities to characterize the roles that organizations and people play with respect to data. And a note that I just took down from the last uh, set of questions that were asked, especially for group decision-making. If there is a something there, a piece of data that needs to um, have a group make decisions about what you can do with it, uh, we need to be able to characterize that group. So we need to be able to say, you know, who's in the group, what they can actually decide, et cetera. So what you see there is a internal database tool that we're working on now uh, that allow us to list organizations that have a role with respect to data and people um, and to store certain facts about them. Now we're providing the framework and the tool, but the, 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 the people who actually decide what roles these organizations play uh, with respect to particular data, that's the, the indigenous community. So we're providing the tool and the framework, the slot, and then that slot needs to be filled. Now we can fill in some of those slots. I just mentioned the ABS, uh, but when it comes to controversial ones, for instance, are such and such people the right group to make decisions about this kind of data? That kind of thing, we can't directly fill that in. We need communities to do that. In fact, even the roles that communities could play need to be determined. And that's part of the stream work one that's going on. Stream, stream one work. Um, now, just one thing, again, this is gonna be very difficult to see, uh, but behind everything that we do, we are making implicit data explicit. So this database looks like an ordinary database. It operates like an, an ordinary database. Secretly behind the scenes, actually not at all secretly, very visibly behind the scenes, all the information that's in there uh, can be extracted in a system independent way so that if we get sick of the database, we lose funding, whatever, all that information, all the relationships that information are preserved. We hope not to have a situation with the ORM that was talked about yesterday, where if the funding ends, uh, you, ha you have a huge job trying to extract data. Data extraction out of this should be very easy, even if the tool goes away. Another part of the work that we're doing is to do with uh, reference spatial data sets. You've seen on that cube that I showed before, uh, we've got um, spatial and methodological and other potential integration points. In our project, we're characterizing several important spatial data sets. Um, and there's a list of a few of them there. Um, you'll see that some of these already exist, things like the indigenous structures within the ASGS, that, that already exists. And we're re-representing it here and, and enhancing it in certain ways. We're only gonna do a few of these in this project, one more than on that list, which you'll see in a second. And um, it's to show a methodology. How do you, characterize spatial information in a way that can be used with the other data that our projects are working with and in a way that's indigenously sensitive. That's what we're trying to do. So we're not trying to characterize all the data that's spatial data that's useful, just some of it. The spatial data is aligned with what we think of as best practice spatial data elsewhere, such as um, data at the ABS and elsewhere. Um, and we can use fairly sophisticated slicing and dicing tooling to cut through data that references the spatial data, like we saw yesterday with the um, indigenous, or sorry, the historical place names Gazetteer. Um, we can slice on spatial axes and other things. And what you see there is a picture of a similar sort of data set that we're working on, but with biodiversity data. And in time, we may, able to, may be able to intersect that data and indigenous data quite effectively because we're using similar structures, vocabularies and things behind the scenes. The important data set that we haven't yet characterized, but we'll get to um, is the Aboriginal Census Police Districts. districts. This is Len's work. Um, the reason it's important, apart from its directly, obviously important <laughs> feel, is that characterizing that data set is forcing us to do certain things which are not normally done with spatial data. Um, and I'll just give one example, fuzzy geometries. A lot of data out there, like postcodes and so on, you've got a polygon and it's a very defined polygon. And it's defined because it is defined. Someone can say, this is where it is. There's no ambiguity. 
a lot of Indigenous spatial data is not so cut and dry. Um, we have to have ambiguity. Um, and so we're working on the technical underpinnings of representing fuzzy geometries and so on. Now, again, as I mentioned previously um, about uh, catalogue roles, this is a universal issue. There are lots of communities, nothing to do with Indigenous, that have a requirement for fuzzy geometries. Yet it turns out a lot of the standards don't actually standardise this stuff. So this project is forcing that. We can't really operate without fuzzy geometries in certain circumstances. We can't, for instance, characterize police districts where one side of the district is well known, it follows a, a river, and then the other side is, you know, off into the wherever that's not well characterized. We, we, we have to have a, a, a system that can handle that to make sense of our own data. And in doing that, we're coming up with, I guess, new approaches which are useful elsewhere. So in this case here, this is my approximation drawn badly in Google Maps, but this is my approximation of Southeast Queensland. And you can see in the uh, the small little polygon there, I'm very certain that that's Southeast Queensland. I'm pretty certain that the next bigger polygon is also Southeast Queensland. And I'm a little bit certain that the bigger polygon is also Southeast Queensland. So this is my confidence in showing someone where Southeast Queensland is. You can see at the bottom there, I'm very confident that Southeast Queensland ends at the New South Wales border. So that's a very sharp bit. But out towards the west, I don't actually know where southeast Queensland ends towards the north and the west. It ends somewhere there, but I don't really know. So this is the kind of thing that we hope to model. And again, feedback to non-Indigenous projects. Um, they can thank us for that later. Now, we do have to, because of the terms of our kind of project, calculate scores for things. And the reason for this is that part of our remit is to make an assessment of how well governed data sets are, uh, how well indigenously governed data sets in existing systems are. And we can only do that because there's lots of them. We can't just go through individually and make an individual human assessment of that. We have to do some kind of systematic assessment, which then may lead on to individual data set assessments. But we have to come up with, you know, the basic question of all the data that's in Trove, what proportion of that is has anything to do with Indigenous people? Sandra, would you like to say anything about Trove? Sure. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, one of the um, inactivity um, 2.1, uh, which was, uh, you might recall, was a scoping of Indigenous data sets. We decided to have a uh, look in Trove and use the Trove API to discover um, Indigenous and Torres Strait Islander data sets that we um, thought would hit the mark. We found between two and 3,000 that um, just eyeballing seemed to meet the mark, um, some of which I'm happy to report uh, showed exemplary data governance practices. Um, credit to Nick Teberger, who's been in this game doing that paradisec with one of, you know, clearly really well described and pointing off to good landing pages that explained the data and explained what it was about, who it was about, and how it could be accessed. Um, other custodians, not so, not so good results. Um, a lot of uh, metadata pointing to other metadata and not taking you anywhere. Um, but it was a really worthwhile exercise in terms of um, engaging with the National Library I think we'll need to be doing that work again, um, exploiting uh, or using uh, Auslan codes. Um, IATSIS have been using Trove as a dissemination mechanism. So there's a lot of uh, data there that we can um, pick up and, and use to sort of characterise in, in bulk and pick up themes and so on. So it was a really useful exercise in seeing a very spotty, um, inconsistent data management landscape, let alone um, Indigenous data management landscape. So I'll just leave it at that. So it's actually from that work that Sandra did that directly led to this requirement to characterise the role which catalogues play with respect to the data in them, because, as she mentioned, there are a lot of stuff in Trove that is actually it's actually a catalog somewhere else first, and then Trove has recatalogued it, and we need more finesse there. Now, the three scores that we've started with uh, to characterize data to ultimately get to Indigenous data governance kind of 
uh, assessments are, two of them at least are pretty well known. So the fair scores, and, and there's a green tick there because fair scores are well known. Uh, there are tools that do calculate fair scores already, and we're just re-implementing that. And we're really using that as a as a um, as a training and um, and uh, uh, I guess um, comparison point for the other scores which are more important to us. We're not too fussed about fair. It's nice to have maybe, but as mentioned yesterday, not always applicable to the kind of data we're after. Uh, but nevertheless, the mechanisms used to do a fair score are relevant mechanisms for our other scores. So a big tick on fair. It's not that hard. Care scores. Now we have a proposed methodology to calculate a care score for something. This is not something that's been done before. Care are a set of principles. They're not usually calculated. They might be self-assessed, but they're not usually calculated from the outside. As far as we know, this hasn't been done. It's going to be rough. We're going to get pretty rough care scores. And we look to engagement and community over time to get better care scores. But nevertheless, we will have a go at that. Now, the last score there that's our most important one is the IDG, Indigenous Data Governance Score. It's a pretty imaginative title. It's not quite as sexy as care and fair and everything else, uh, but it is the direct our direct assessment of how well governed a piece of a data set, let's say, is from an Indigenous perspective. Um, in fact, it's not even from an Indigenous perspective. It's how well governed a data set is compared to how it should be. <laughs> and Indigenous is part of that. So I'm going to talk about that in a second. Here it is. Indigenous data governance. So the first question we ask about a data set is, is it Indigenous at all? If it's not Indigenous, it could get a very good Indigenous data governance score uh, because it doesn't need to have Indigenous involvement. It doesn't. Sounds fine to me. If it is Indigenous, then we have to ask the second question, which also seems to have the number one. Uh, but if so, does it have appropriate relations to appropriate agents? And you'll remember that I've talked a few minutes ago about the agents database that we have. That's going to characterize the agents that we know about, so organizations and people, and their essentially their ability to provide Indigenous governance. So that database is our set of agents, and we now have to work out whether the data we're looking at has appropriate relations to appropriate agents. So firstly, is the data Indigenous? Well, as Sandra mentioned from Trove, we can find data that's declared to be Indigenous by looking at things like keywords, language tags. Is it in a collection that's an Indigenous collection? So Trove has that. Um, lots of catalogs have that. They say this is all Indigenous data. They put it in there. So that's a very easy one. Um, we have to find all the different ways things could be declared. But nevertheless, that's a finite thing. It's not particularly difficult. The hard one is whether uh, we can infer data to be Indigenous. Um, and, and to do this, this is an open-ended thing that's going to be solved in better and better ways over time. But we're not going to solve it in this project. But we can look at things like the text that's used, the, the language and so on, and, and work out whether the data is Indigenous or about Indigenous things. And this is a massive area of computer science work. There's enormous amounts of data classification and so on going on around the world. And we hope that our framework uh, that we're working with here permits increased skill in that area. So we're not trying to do automated assessment of content to work out whether it's Indigenous, but we certainly do want to have that slot available. I put the little acronym machine learning in there. Yes, we can look at text. We might look at metadata text like descriptions and abstracts, but in time, people can look at content and make assessments as to, you know, the way in which this data is or what, what it's talking about, how to characterize it. And some of that can be Indigenous assessment. So taking for granted that data is Indigenous in a particular case, we then ask, does it have appropriate relations to appropriate agents? And what we're looking at here is you can see the little picture. There's a data set. It's Indigenous in some way. Does it have this relation and the relation, it could have many relations, but does the relation join this data set to a particular agent with a particular role? And it's the agents and roles we've got the database for and vocabularies. And here's an example, rather than boring you with the vocabularies, here's an example of the um, indigenous locations within the Australian Statistical Geography Standard. Now, the way this data was put online about a year and a half ago didn't indicate any indigenous engagement in the data set. It did in the discursive text, but it didn't in the machine readable metadata that a machine would find and be able to automatically assess. So all we've done is taken the written description of the way in which this data is managed and governed by the ABS and placed that into machine readable form in the mechanism I've just described. Now, whether that is appropriate or not is not for us to judge. That is for community to judge but to represent what the ABS is saying about the data is our task. So what the ABS tells us is that, and you can see there's a so-called qualified attribution thing there. 
There's other metadata too, um, but there's qualified attribution. And it says that this data set, the, the rights holder is the ABS. You could dispute that. You might think that's not appropriate, but that's what they say it is. Uh, the um, custodian is also the ABS. But the special one that's interesting here is the subject agent representative. So that is a group or a body that represents who or what this data is about and their interests. So Indigenous locations are obviously something of importance to Indigenous people. And so their representative in this case is this coatsis group at the ABS. So that is a consultative body within the ABS. Now, again, we can't, or I certainly can't judge whether coatsis is any good or not. That's not for me to make a call on, but I can record that that's what the ABS have said uh, or that who the ABS have said is their group. And then people can look at that and make their own judgment as to whether that's appropriate. So the, the indigenous data governance score here will hinge on whether that group, which we can see has a relation to the data is appropriate for this data. And superficially, we assume that it's perfectly appropriate. And then we leave it up to people to, to judge whether that is in fact the case or not. But what we've done is we've represented that relation and other relations too, as I say, rights holder, et cetera. So that's the core of our Indigenous data governance scores. It's the distance between what we think data should have based on the facts of its Indigenousness and so on versus the declared relationships that we can discover about that. And so if the relationship's not declared, we, we, we give it a zero score. If this data had no subject agent representative at all, not even a declared one, then it would have a lesser score than if it had at least some. Now, a small case study. Um, Sam, who uh, sadly, again, can't be here, uh, he is working on a, an Indigenous data catalogue within the Australian National University. And these are the points from his project plan. Um, it's to develop a machine-readable Indigenous data catalogue for ANU. They, they just simply don't have a centralised or comprehensive or even very good listing of Indigenous data anywhere, as far as we can tell. Um, Sam's had to work through proxies like ethics approvals and projects and all kinds of things to try and discover um, where and what might be Indigenous data within the university. Um, he needs to create a keeping place for that orphaned and legacy data that's within the ANU. Um, and then the last two points, they're building Indigenous capacity um, within, within, again, the ANU and providing Indigenous governance, uh, data governance and, and uh, sovereignty principles. Now, the two things that we're doing in this project to directly assist with that, one is that using the catalogue profile and some other tooling that was mentioned yesterday, the way to bundle up data, um, uh, we're supplying, I guess, a copy or an instance of that to Sam to actually create an actual technical catalogue and put things in. Um, and we've only just started on the advice side and the capacity building side. That's part and parcel of the larger Indigenous data network, as mentioned in the previous talk. But both of these things will impact on his work. Oh, and I'll just mention, lastly, we, will, we do expect to have an instance of a catalogue that is at least initially only available within the ANU, but that all elements and the, the way the stuff in that catalogue is presented and described will be the same as the way we do assessments of public data, so that if you get hold of an internal record for whatever reason, you'll th see things like the subject agent representative role and standardised metadata. So even though that data is not public, it should be described in a similar way to public data and to standardised data so that it, you don't have to go and do research to work out what the hell they're talking about. Last couple of slides. So we've got plans for the future in two chunks. The first set are for the next 12 months, and then there's beyond the next 12 months. This is partly a reflection on funding cycles and things. I think it's obvious. Um, in the next 12 months, what do we have to do? We have to continue to operate the, the reference resources that we've made. So we have, now that we've established an agent's database, if we can, in the next few months before June, show that it has value and purpose, uh, we'll need to continue to operate that. We can't stop operating these kinds of things if they reference data sets. That's very important. That's our number one thing. Things established must continue to live on. And we've done the best we can to make it cheap and easy to operate that, but nevertheless, it has to continue. We have to keep testing our tools. If we start doing things like creating scores, we have to actually you know, put those scores to people and get feedback and, and work on that. And, and even at a small rate, even if we're in a kind of a caretaker mode, we still have to be able to do that to some extent. We have to say, yes, we've heard your feedback, we've recorded it, and we either can do something about it now or plan to in the future. Um, we do want to get organizations to adopt our catalog profile. And that slide I showed before about the ABS stuff, that is, that is adopted in the sense that our catalog profile is being used to represent information from the ABS on an ABS managed resource. And we want to roll that 
catalog profile out to other data holders. And this should be a fairly straightforward job for all the catalogs I've ever worked with, including Geoscience Australia, data.gov.au. These kinds of catalogs should be able to adopt this profile pretty easily. Uh, we also hope to work through that Deputy Secretary's data group and elsewhere uh, so that when organizations that are doing a renewed catalog effort somewhere inevitably ask the question, how should we catalog indigenous stuff? They look to our catalog profile as the suggestion as to how to do that. Um, we will, in the next 12 months, work on other deployments of catalog instances, and that's in particular ANU, but there could be others. And that's because we can make a mini one and put it over there. And it might be hidden, but it still uses our reference resources. Um, and we want to form up the Indigenous Data Network's advisory role. We know we have this role, it's been asked of us, uh, but we haven't really formed that up. We, we haven't taken questions and provided advice in a formulaic manner. Beyond the next 12 months, we will eventually, not just in the Indigenous Data Network, but overall, need to come to a, 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 an arrangement to do with um, a digital keeping place for Indigenous data. I think that's obvious. What that arrangement is, is it that everything comes into a special repository that I run on my system at home? Probably not. Is it a distributed thing that is horses for courses in terms of where you might put Indigenous data, but there are kind of um, standardised ways of representing that data? That's probably more likely. Uh, does it involve a renewed arrangement with organizations due to the voice? Maybe, we don't know, but we do need to come up with something there. And that, and that needs to be stated. It's, it's in our current uh, Indigenous Data Network um, directions, and we need to uh, keep doing that in the next, you know, after 12 months. Uh, we do have a um, an item to do digital repatriation or rematriation, as it's sometimes called. Um, we do need to, as Kristen and uh, Levi mentioned, find data uh, that Indigenous people do not have access to and, e and, and either give them access to it and or return it to them. So that, that's part of the Indigenous Data Network's goals. And our cataloging and so on has a role in that because if we can characterize things, we can work out what is appropriate to do with it to some extent. Uh, we need to develop that advisory role that we've claimed with others, so other organizations. We're not the only Indigenous uh, data organization in the country, and we need to work out exactly who does what where effectively with each other. And finally, and, and importantly, we need to continue uh, establish and continue a, a transfer of knowledge between data professionals such as myself and Indigenous groups. And that's two-way. And I, um, it was asked of us before what we've got out of uh, paying respect to Indigenous elders, past and present, etc. I, I can say I've learned a few things about data from this project, like the fuzzy geometries and things, but also the, the um, uh, group decision-making around data access and so on. You know, these are things that I learn. And so, so it's that way. And then what I hope to return back uh, you know, principles of data management and so on. Yeah. That's it. I think we're, we're done on slides. Thank you, Len, Sandra, and Nicholas. Are there any questions? This is a question. Um... <clears throat> just in relation to, I guess, the spatial side of things. Could you maybe hit up that Southeast Queensland slide for me, please? Because this was an interesting way to view the representation of data. I thought, and I don't know if it's a Sandra question or something, but in, in the example you use, could this be represented if we're looking at historical data and data sets that, you know, you said you were confident that that first one, but less confident about the, the Mackay reach, right? Um, which very clearly is not. If you come from Queensland, you'd know. <laughs> um, but is there a way to represent that data in saying that, okay, that strong circle there from Sunshine Coast to Gold Coast, well, 500 sources a catalog, uh, 500 sources are recorded that say that's Southeast Queensland, whereas Bundaberg down, there's a few less, you know, and then Mackay down, there's maybe two sources, but it still shows in that spatial form. Is that a way, is that what you're getting at there? Because what I'm thinking of in, is in terms of all of that historical data that says this is such and such country here. One one anthropologist said this and, you know, and, and a way to view that in terms of how many sources are correlating in terms of, you know, where, where the strengthened part is you know, versus where it's sort of the boundaries differ a little bit. You get what I mean? Yeah. Look, and then also too, flipping what was a what was a modern source, what was historical source, what was in indigenously and all the rest of it. 
Yeah, look, that's exactly what the kind of thing is designed for. Uh, really, what you see there, I mean, that's just made up, you know, my impression of where Southeast Queensland is. But what you're seeing is there's a theoretical, what we call a feature, Southeast Queensland, and it has a specific or multiple geometries, in this case, those polygons. And those geometries have evidence for them. Now, there's no evidence, so I just made it up. But in your case, you've given me evidence. You said there are a certain number of historical sources that specify this one, and then there's, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So this feature can have a series of geometries with different levels of evidence. They don't have to be numerical. They could, you know, they could all kinds of things that you might use to arrive at evidence. Uh, but then taken together, that set provides a, an approximation of where this area is with higher and lower confidences. And so if you've got a lot of sources say, well, we definitely know this indigenous area is here because and, and it's sort of less so it'll it'll end up like that. And where there's high, uh, where those sources all agree, you'll have high confidence or where they don't agree, there'll be lower confidence. And you and if when we improve the tooling, that set of polygons will be a blurred kind of smooth color thing. The darker the color, the more strong and so on. But it's all informed by different things with evidence. And yeah, the one you gave is a perfect example. And just following on from that because then you'd find you'd find the section where there's an outlier and there might be one or two sources and then you can determine the veracity or the cultural veracity of that source right you know because you'd look for the outlier but then there'd be an instance of course where you find that outlier and you read through it yourself with with that applied knowledge and then you go actually that's been mistagged or that's been misrepresented and that's why it's an outlier so you need to reflect. I know I've done that with libraries and different things. I say, oh, this has been tagged wrong. Is how do we fix so that? Or we're gonna, yeah, we're gonna do that with the police districts to some extent. We're gonna take our best guess at where they are and characterize them, but then we'll produce the spatial layer, you know, police districts and they're these fuzzy geometries. And as evidence grows about that. Uh, informing, you know, positively or negatively, those things will change. And, and we can represent, I mean, we can re represent changes of actual geometries in actual time, you know, where a flood area was, but we can also uh, represent over time where our impressions of a geometry or other thing would be. So in 1995, we thought the thing was here. In 2022, we thought it was here, et cetera, et cetera. So either one of those is possible. This is that kind of time changing stuff is fairly straightforward and well known. What's not well known is that that weight of evidence for different versions of the same thing. And that's what's being introduced. And I should say, this mechanism will be contrib contributed back to an international data standard, again, not just indigenous. Yeah. Um, I might just quickly um, add there, Robert, uh, we're also really concerned, I mean, in Len's case study of a variety of sources around police districts and gaps and all of that sort of thing you find in historical work, we're also very concerned to easily um, make accessible the provenance underlying yeah the evidence you know, around the evidence of these um sorts of decisions and exposing that in a way um you know that is that is becomes um very easy to to explore that sort of well what is the evidence behind this sort of assertion in a way that probably current GIS systems don't really do, and in a way uh, very similar to the aims and goals of our, our colleagues in TLC Map and, and GHAP, and you know we, we hope to work closely with them on getting better historical data and dates and times and that. So lens casework with images and this that and the other and various work, bringing that all together, um, it's a really interesting case study to exercise these kinds of methods. I'll jump in there too. Um, just if you bringing that up, um, raising that, that was a really good point. Um, I will point you back to the, the round table that we held last year in June as well, if that's of interest and you wanted to kind of expand that out a bit more. Um, the presentation that Michael Ed delivered in, in, in the round table is directly talking about that stuff as well. So you might find that interesting. Just thought I'd point people back to there. Uh, yeah, and look, uh, I mean, the GIS people have got really smart tools for dealing with this sort of stuff. I mean, we're talking about police districts here, but it's the same thing really applies like with language locations as well, that you can triangulate and constrain these fuzzy geometries by saying, okay, well, this is South Queensland, South East Queensland, but we know there's a police station at Mackay, say. Um, so, so it sort of pushes the boundary back the other way as well, and so you can get some probabilistic assessment on that basis too. 
An observation. Well, I don't know whether it's an observation, but just a thought. As you were talking, um, in uh, what was it? In the year seventeen ten, here in this part of the world, what sort of data were the original inhabitants relying on and gathering? How did they gather it? How did they record it and memorize it and distribute it? Is one observation. And then come 1788, how did colonial impacts affect that data and process of, from a trauma point of view, how, how did it distort all things like that? And forced removals and massacres and how did that interrupt the whole flow of data communication and I'm sort of I'm thinking 1710 would have been through song and ceremony and dance and that's the importance of those things so but yeah just observation that's all I, I can't really answer that <laughs> uh, but I can say something that we're doing on the technical front that will assist with that sort of thing so in the same way that we've got a fancy way of doing a feature with geometries and, and weighted evidence for them. Uh, we can do a little bit more than that too. We can say that this feature, you know, the, the Yorta Yorta people's lands or some, something like that, uh, we don't have to just describe it in geometric terms. We can describe it discursively or in a narrative form. And even if we can't go from there to a thing on a map directly, uh, we can co-record these things. So we can say the, the, the conceptual object is the homelands of a certain people. And this is how it has been or is described narratively. And then we can approximate that if, if we want to or if we need to spatially and we can keep those things joined up and it's part of our process of making implicit data explicit to connect bits of information that should be connected so in this case the, the narrative form of a of a description of a piece of land should be tied to the thing that you see in the gis to the point that sandra mentioned if you click on that thing it might say well actually this is based on a narrative geometry and there's imprecision there, but here is the narrative geometry, you know, you make your own assessment or, or whatever. So we do want to keep these things close to each other and represent different forms of, of knowledge, even if we can't always do a perfect mapping. If the knowledge holders so choose, of course, yeah. to yeah. share that, that's yeah. up to them. Yeah, I, I'm really interested in this fuzzy geometry thing, but I think um, it's... It, we need to go beyond fuzzy geometry to fuzzy history to fuzzy truth. Um, all, all together and, and take that that metaphor of, of, of the fuzzy overlay to every, everything that applies to, um, to Aboriginal people, particularly the stuff that white fellows have written down. Um, and I, th I think about examples from when I was working at Uluru, we were trying to develop a, a, a booklet of stories that bus drivers could tell to tourists about uh, different places around the bottom of Uluru. And in the process of developing this booklet, I found like 15 or 16 different recorded versions of these stories in various ethnographic works or travellers' tales or whatever. And all of them were different. Um, and, you know, some of them majorly different. Uh, and then so, so I went around and, and recorded a whole bunch of elders in the community, like 10 or 15 elders, uh, talking about these stories and all of them were different too there, there is a fuzziness that's about the way people tell stories but if you looked at the core of what you know the overlap of all of those stories there is a core of essential truth there that's recorded in that in that fuzzy narrative with a very data-centric answer the general mechanism that we use for this sort of thing is to separate the conceptual identity of something from its projection. So in this case here, we're looking at the conceptual entity of Southeast Queensland, and there's several approximations of where it actually is spatially. In that case, it could be that there is a conceptual thing, a story about something or other, and the way that that story is actually related is different. So it's projection into actual narrative is there are several issuances of that. So that's the general, oh, doesn't always apply, but that's a general mechanism. I, I, I guess too the the second dimension to that is that um, one one particular story I I got four versions of it one of which was the story that's told to children one of which is the story that's shared between men and women one of which was the story that only men know and one of which was the story that only old men know um, and all of them had 
the kids' story at the base of them, but just more and more elements that explain different aspects of social interaction with, with that story. Um, so, you know, all true, uh, but all different. Uh, and then there were all of the wrong versions of that story that white fellas had had also written down. So, you know, some some were true, some were not true. I mean, this it's... relates to Steve's point earlier about whether the questions and things are the same. The, the, the essential issue is to work out whether, with the conceptually, this is actually the same thing at all. If you can at least establish that, then you can say, are these variations with scope for a certain purpose as you just mentioned it's actually the same story but for children for men for old men etc so that's a scoped version of the same thing where you get into trouble is when it's actually not the same thing it's actually a different thing altogether and that's that's there's no specific answer to that but i would say that the logic used to work out whether this question and that is the same has some analog to the way we would do what you're describing there i think in that case it's quite straightforward you said they're all based on this child story perhaps but then they have more and more detail and, and knowledge and so on so yeah, I think we can do something there. It's about joining the facts up in the in a in a well-defined manner. And that was again one of our fund, foundational principles in our project is to do that sort of knowledge joining. John, that, that that's what you're talking about is a very strong cultural tradition. And and when boy becomes man, he leaves mothers to become man, but you don't become a man in a day. And you don't learn to become a man in one ceremony. And that's why ceremony continues as a cultural component of passing on information. And the other thing is the diversity of story. Who cares that there might be five different interpretations of this particular totem story? For example, the Willy Wagtail or Chitta Chitta, he messenger for death for some people, he messenger for integrity and other things here. But to the old girls that Uluru, they see him as which way? Gossip bird. You're listening into the story. But that's deadly that there's all different interpretations. And they don't have to have one universal. And that's something that's got to be considered too. Yeah. Any other questions? I just have one from online. Uh, Who is this online? I haven't met her. This is uh, Jelena Haynes. <laughs> May I ask if there is any intention to, to extend the project to South Australia? I think it's a national project. It's a national project, yeah. We may have given Queensland-centric examples because that's where I come from, uh, but no, no, it's a totally national project and we're work working mostly with large data holders generally. I mean, this example is about Queensland, but uh, mostly national data holders, which of course are, are national, not location-based. Thanks. And just a comment to say thanks for the question and examples uh, to bring it together more for the use of fuzzy boundaries to look at the police district's data. And that's from Janet McDougall at ADA, Australian Data Archive. And the other thing, John, uh, sorry, Len, you come. Uh, just to say, yes, Sam Ray in uh, South Australia is a partner in this project. So you was on the fuzzy conversation before John and when you put your jumper on you reminded me of yesterday fuzzy wuzzy was a bear and you got into all that fuzzy wuzzy communication just there I'm starting to rock it um Nicholas um can you pass on our regards to Sam that was Sam just there last yes. yesterday yeah I'm sorry to hear that and um just to let him know that we were thinking of him mm -hmm. and Len You've been an old timer for a long time in this space. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and again, you can see that and you feel that. So I don't know whether anyone's ever said it to you, but thank you for your longstanding contribution and commitment to advancing our interests as a people. Okay, are we ready? We're on our last session now. Now, a little bit of goss at lunch, you know, things you do at lunchtime. 
I had uh, three, I've got to admit, I had three of them little hot dog, no, burger rolls. Figured out I didn't, but bloody Helen, she had six and was hiding them. And then uh, who was into the chocolate mousse? Well, when I got the recipe here, a little bit too sweet. And Steve, what, how many do you have? <laughs> okay. Um, we're going to go into our last, well, formal session as a group, and then uh, there'll be a planning group that will go off and meet after this from each of the project areas. But this last conversation is going to be with Kristen and Levi, uh, who will probe discuss, talk about future requirements for Indigenous research capability. Yeah? Sometime today would be lovely, Levi. <laughs> I guess we should start off with um, Professor Marcia Langton sends her apologies. She can't be here today. She The last two days she's been in the referendum working group and expert panel. So doing some fairly serious business on the side. Unfortunately, she only found out about a week ago, but we all understand why that needs to be a priority of, for all things at the moment. So there's hopeful things that are happening in that space, but she sends her apologi apologies to everyone, but is really looking forward to hearing back um, on what the discussions were and what everyone has been reporting on for each of the individual projects, but also really interested to hear more about what everyone thinks um, in terms of how we start to think about moving forward into the future, particularly in the space of Indigenous research capabilities. So, Levi, do you want to start, kick off the discussion? Yeah, and I guess I'd probably, uh, just to jog everyone's imagination and, you know, open the discussion, probably will revert back to a few things that have uh, been themes throughout the last two days. Uh, one of which is looking, and when we talk about the the aspiration, I guess, for uh, future research endeavours in the country moving forward. Um, and, you know, we talk about the, the uh, pipeline, it's a terrible word, but, um, you know, what is it over the next 10 years, along with the infrastructure build, what is it that we actually need to um, actionably do and kind of expand and work on um, as far as improving uh, research capability for people throughout the throughout the country. So feel free to have any any input or any questions even, just open dialogue. John? <laughs> okay. Um, Chelsea Bond and I wrote a, um, an article a few years ago called Beyond the Pipeline. Um, we were looking at um, the production of health workers um, over the last 20 years. And the metaphor of the pipeline in this instance is the same as in, in that case. It's not a pipeline, it's it's a hose and nobody's bothered to turn it on. Um, it's a, you know, a tiny little dribble of, of people who are going through undergraduate IT courses or undergraduate um, public health courses that will lead into um, postgraduate study in in um, quantitative science. So if we think back 20 years, what was happening then uh, at, at ANU was the Master of Applied Epidemiology in Indigenous um, Statistics. And we got um, maybe 10 or 15 really top-notch graduates out of that program, maybe more. Um, but the, I, I know 10 or 15 of them who are working now. We really need to be thinking about, about that. We need to dedicate some resources to targeting promising young Aboriginal undergraduates and pushing them into, um, into a, a dedicated master's course that's going to teach them some, uh, some data science stuff. That's all. Yeah, no, thanks for that. I, I, I yeah, echo and agree with that. Well, also just thinking at the launch of the new centre that Levi and I and the IDN are in, they were talking through some of the history of 
there was a previous iteration of the center earlier on it's now been reinvigorated um, and Ian Anderson Professor Ian Anderson was up there talking about how um, in the 80s I think he said there was something like three Indigenous students enrolled in the medical faculty at the moment we've got a hundred so I mean things are turning around particularly in that area but I don't know about everyone else around the room, but from our perspective, when we're trying to recruit, when we're trying to do all sorts of things and train people up, there's really not uh, a, a workforce at all or enough training going into Indigenous people in the data sciences as we're finding a significant issue. So I'm assuming everyone else is having similar experiences. Okay, so uh, I, I get it. There's a bit of confusion, I think, between data science and quantitative data, census data figures, and you were talking about, you know, cultural centres that have all these videos and audios and this sort of qualitative data. I think we really need to tease that apart because they're not the same things. Yeah. And I think most Aboriginal people that I know wouldn't care about the quantitative data, but they really, really care about the qualitative. They really care about recordings and, you know, stuff. And especially now with language revitalization, it's my thing that I'm interested in, going back to early records is really, really important and finding those records and bringing them back and using them in, in language programs. So um, it seems to me, you know, you, you've got all the data science stuff, that's one thing. You've got cataloging of existing collections and access, so IATSIS is the issue here, I, I, you know, access to um, items that exist. And then there's making safe all the stuff that's in those local cultural centres that's not safe. You know, that's, I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah we know it's, it's at risk. We know of places that have been flooded, that burned down and the stuff that's gone. So we need, you know, a flying squad or we need advice and good tools for those people. So I think in this whole discussion, it'd be really good to try and keep those things separate. So it gets, it can get very confusing. Uh, if you're talking about, you know, this and it's actually that, and, you know, yeah. Thanks, Lee. No, agreed. There are a lot of areas, and whether we're talking disciplinary or otherwise, that there are huge gaps at the moment. And it, you, you're very right. I think whether it be university by university or even nationally, we start have to really start thinking about how we plan for that. Yeah. As you said, data science is one area, but it's not the only area where we really need to have more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people coming up and taking charge of it. We've been talking about Indigenous data governance and sovereignty, yeah. and that's not going to happen without Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people taking the lead on it. Yeah, taking lead and also being supported into that leadership as well, right? Like that, it's not a conversation or a dialogue that can occur without one without the other. Um, and I will, well, you know, just to kind of keep the um, open discussion going, we'll spare back to the idea of the concept of language. Language is important. Language matters. Um, language does provide reality and structure over that, right? Um, the only reason why I ever became a nurse in community is because once upon a time, someone told me that I could. And someone told me that I had all these really good qualities that, you know, is indicative of a nurse. And it was through constant, like, repeated and reminding that, you know, you manifest that and you, and you, you, you see opportunities. But opportunities not always, like, you know, it's not the job of, you know, self-exploration discovery. Everyone has a responsibility too. And so when I talk about language, language historically um, has had the unfortunate ability to kind of lock people out of stuff too, right? Can't be what you can't see. That was mentioned yesterday. You also like I challenge that and say, like, if you don't hear that and you don't see that around you in your world, like you'll never be that. You know what I mean? So I guess I'd open it up to like again, uh, to discussion. What's everyone's thoughts about like language? And we're talking about like, you know, future ongoing needs around infrastructure. Um, what's the future ongoing need around language? Picking up on some of the uh, some theme that Nick mentioned as well. No thoughts for anyone. <laughs> Do we? I, I guess you know Levi's trying to say there really needs to be a rethinking and a reshaping because the way that the language has been produced and developed over time it's through a very Western colonial lens, mm -hmm. and sometimes. As other discussions have been had over the last couple of days, um, mean, some words mean many things um, and not necessarily good things in different contexts. So thinking through also when 
essentially tasks like this is going to require everybody coming together, whether we're talking about, you know, disciplines, you know, personally, medical anthropology, we've got data science, we've got archivists, we've got librarians, we've got a whole variety of different of disciplines. We can't even talk to each other generally particularly well. Mm. So, you know, we get into these mixed method projects or mi mixed disciplinary projects, and we're really not that great at talking to one another. So starting to think of that overarching way that we think through these problems, I think is going to be one of the core mm. issues that we're going to have to tackle in coming years. Hi, I just have a comment from online from Dr. Jelena Haynes, who says that she's noticed the big gaps in South Australia, especially in library and information science, which is an important field of field to encourage Indigenous students to gain knowledge and skills to record and preserve their knowledge in their own context. I think we can all um, agree that we all experience similar things like that. Um, Look, glam sector is not my sector. <laughs> um, perhaps we've got someone in the room who'd like to comment on that. No, potentially no. Is there anyone online? <laughs> well, perhaps we'll move on from that. Yeah. Oh, sorry. The um, I was I was going to sort of talking about that. Yeah. You know, um, I've always been, as as much as I might be, um, big note in the other day there, well, about saying, you know, I got a couple of degrees and that. Anyhow, I, I've always felt like I'm a liaison officer or an interpreter. And I think a lot of Indigenous people in all, no matter what level you're at, that you're still nearly like an, um, a liaison officer or an interpreter. And, and yeah, because I'll, I'll tell you, I have two boys at home and one's an engineer um, at Boeing and the other one's a sound designer. And I don't know if you know anything about sound design. They're the ones that sit there and put the sound into movies, computer games, the whole lot. And we sit at the table and have dinner without telling you too much personal stuff. <laughs> and and we don't actually say much to each other <laughs> because they're sort of like, you know, he's the engineer, he's the engineer, another one's a sound designer, and they're really into the computers and they don't say much. <laughs> and and I'm and I'm actually a social worker, so <laughs> rave on a bit. And so we got uh, and and that's what we're talking about here a little bit. And I'm saying we're all Aboriginal people. You know, like at home there, yeah. and um, and then I add my wife in the mix, and she's Irish British background, so we have a interesting um, conversation. <laughs> and sometimes I feel like that that's what's going on here, is we got all these different backgrounds, and we're trying to work on Indigenous issues, and then coming from all these different disciplines, yeah. and like in the house feel I. I I, th I think I'm located there as a social worker, but yeah. love you know love mob work and mob yarning yeah. up. So my point about this is saying that we're trying to bring a whole bunch of different people together yeah. to to work this out, yeah. and and hopefully we can yeah. because but we can't leave out the liaison officers. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and and let me say. There's also our, um, remember someone had a shirt there um, where they say, oh, I'm, I'm safe or something for Indigenous people. What do they say? <laughs> a, you know, ally, that's the word. You know, I'm a safe ally, you know, and you're going, I think that's also what we need as well. We need safe allies with us that we know that we're going to trust them with our stuff. They're not going to do us in. So if if we can find people like that to work on these projects, I think that that's a good thing. That's a bit of a yarn, and I'm I'm doing I'm doing the old yarning to tell a yarn. <laughs> Perfect example. <laughs> Just following on from that point about the safe allies is. 
I don't think nowadays you can be successful if you're not working in the best interests of mobs and communities. However, on the flip side of that, from a monitoring perspective, perhaps there's a conversation around big institutions need to apply some monitoring mechanisms to assess and find out who those people aren't aren't safe allies anymore <clears throat> or who slipped through the radar back in the day and are still highly acclaimed um, academics who don't hold the best interests of Indigenous people but have made a career, um, you know, a career off using Indigenous data. And those people still exist <laughs> and they are still very much alive. Um, and for communities, I have heard communities explicitly say, I'm just waiting for that old bugger to die so I can actually go and do some proper work. So just on the flip side of it. And I think that's a really familiar tale as well. Um, the amount of times that you go into different communities and there's always a story of a pretty dodgy researcher coming in and not doing so great things in whatever context it is. And look, I mean, a lot of it, probably ignorance. We can chalk it up. It's history. We do need to know about it. And if people are still operating in that way today, which we know that there are, there's every good reason for people to be a little bit suspicious and to actually ask of researchers mm -hmm. to do the things that we really should be doing, mm -hmm. you know. Um, yeah, I, I thought that last point's interesting, and I, I do think there's some other changes in the in the broader kind of research environment that that go to the point that you made too, Robin. One of the things that was happening when we were looking to have an era, and we won't we won't be having an era assessment. Uh, so, so for people who don't know what that is, that's a an evaluation of the quality of university research. And there was going to be one in um, 2023. And, and one of the things that it would have had to incorporate is that we now have um, new research codes. And, and so, so research is evaluated against research classification, one of the, one of the classifications, the standards that we've been talking about. And, and, and there, is a, there is a new Indigenous, it's called Indigenous Studies. And, and there was a proposal to actually think about how do you evaluate research in Indigenous studies? And, and in particular, what do you need to do to consider issues such as community benefit, community leadership, community engagement? Now, we're not, um, we are not sort of going to have an era and we're going to move probably to a different kind of process. Um, but the, some of the signs were there that around something like that, which kind of shapes stuff quite importantly for universities. You know, there are some changes in other parts of, of this system that, that sort of also go to some of the things that we're talking about. Yeah, look, I think there needs to be general institutional and national change when we yeah. think about the way that we do Indigenous research. It's very, very clear that there are a multitude, a multitude of elements that are required when you are working with Indigenous people. We're all working with Indigenous people when we're talking about data. Um, that isn't necessarily the case in other fields of research or other areas. For example, you know, if you get your standard ARC um, grant, you do not have a budget there for the extensive consultations. You do not have an extended timeline for the extensive consultations that are required. You do not have the requirements in there to have the onward going conversations and feeding back into the community, the research that you've done. And I think, you know, across Australian research, we need to have a really significant think about that. Some of the philanthropic um, grant bodies are starting to factor that in, but very slowly, which means that we are going to have rubbish research that continues on, that disrespects the people they're working with, that doesn't actually factor in anything to do with Indigenous data governance or Indigenous data sovereignty, because it doesn't allow that. And it's very, very disrespectful. And I think as a nation, we really need to start, take that on board and significantly advocate for change. You know, whether ARC, um, you know, the NHMRC, wherever it happens to be, if we're doing research in these areas, you know, researchers are the ones who are going to have to advocate for that change. It's not going to happen by itself. I had a comment from Dr. Jelena Haynes, who said that she agrees with Dr. Stephen uh, that we need to include the voices of liaison and integrating storytellers' voices and their lived-in experience in the discussion. 
Yeah, <clears throat> I'd probably, um, yeah, kind of, you know, feeding back on that dialogue and um, responding. Y yes, we need to include those voices, but that liaison stuff in the gap work there, that is a gap. And it's not also just the job of like the liaison or the, like, you know, the Indigenous person in that position, because I tell you now, that's burdensome as well, right? So this is the reason why we're asking questions. What's actually missing? What are some suggestions? And it's not, oh, let's load bear that up of the, of the person in that position. That ain't it. It's just like, this is the reason why, you know, we're asking questions. It's just like from, you know, the amount of knowledge and from knowledge expert holders and stuff in the room, it's just like, just one really pragmatic thinking. It's just like, I don't want to be this exhausted by the time I'm like, you know, Marcia's age. It's just like, I don't want to get there and have the same question and trying to be finding the same solution. Because if that's the case, like, same. And, you know, when we talk about research and stuff, I think it needs to actually precognite before we get to, like, the level of a master's. I think, you know, data, you know, we're in the fourth industrial revolution. Data is in, in every part of every job. So it's just like, no, 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 there's actually a focus that needs to shift. This is my opinion anyway. Um, we need to be doing that, like, at the very core essence. It's just like, how do you interact with data in your, in your world? What role does that play? You know what I mean? And then, like, then the specialisation and that stuff. So I'd like to hear everyone else's thoughts about that. Hi, I've just got, um, from my limited experience, um, a little bit of a comment around um, the resourcing and the time and your the point to not wanting to burden people with the responsibility around education, extension, um, liaison, et cetera, of um, my experience of the time and energy it takes to come to a shared understanding between the researcher and the TOs of what Indigenous data is, what Indigenous data governs, governance and sovereignty is. And I think that there's a role just to support that around education of both researchers and TOs. So we have a shared understanding beyond Indigenous data as um, traditional knowledge, mm. like a broader understanding of Indigenous data and your rights and interests. Um, I think would be, there's, I, I see roles for that. There's a real need because are people out there doing it out of the kindness of their heart and their spare time or, or really extending themselves and burning themselves out? So. That, that, that comment's lovely. Yeah, thanks. Any other burning thoughts in the room that you want to talk about? Um, I just want to come back to the concept of the ally. Um, and we've been talking about pipelines over the last couple of days. How do we start to think through a pipeline for actually teaching people how to be a good ally instead of just thinking maybe they're doing the right thing you know actually some concrete um, pathway forwards for that um, I know that you know I know that IATSIS has the core cultural training but it's kind of an opt-in kind of situation um, yeah what can we do to further allyship I guess mm. Yeah, and, you know, bouncing off that comment too then, Jenny, I guess, like, we need to probably reevaluate the actual very, you know, very definition of allyship, you know, because it actually does imply that you do renounce and actually align yourself with, like, you know. So that's not necessarily the case. I don't think we, you know, I don't think there's, like, across the board, there's a full spectrum of people that have that level of, like, or that humility and stuff and practice and, you know, renouncing that and actually wanting to seek solutions and actually wanting to be informed and wanting to work in a way that's, like, you know, non-injurious. So just be thought as well. I guess taking it in another direction, I was just, what's that? Oh, there's another question. Oh, sorry, Sandra. Thank, thank you. Um, 
just before the round table, I forget which journal it was. I think it was an international journal of regional health and the editorial board of that journal adopted a policy position that said, we're not going to publish any research articles unless the researcher can demonstrate that care principles have been followed um, by, and put the onus on the researcher to show that. And in a past life, when I used to be a trade union official dealing with issues of technological change, um, consultation gets you so far, but let's face it, it's not easy to do this stuff. It does take time to be done properly. And that is not something that either universities or funding bodies want to hear. Mm. And they need to be being advised on researchers should be able to submit in their applications sufficient resourcing and time to make this happen because perhaps the consequence of it not happening is that research doesn't get published, universities will suffer reputational damage, some things that they really we know they really do care about. Um, so that's just the old trade union official coming out in me there a bit that, you know, um, possibly maybe trying to exert uh, influence on commercial publishers to adopt these kinds of standards uh, might win a few hearts and minds. Thanks, Sandra. I think that's a great idea because we know that there are a lot of publishers out there who are also asking for advice and how they can engage with um, Indigenous data governance and, and protocols and standards. So that's actually a really helpful piece of advice. Well, the only thing I worry about is the researchers who are trying to publish in there and then they're not getting the funding. But in turn, it does push back on the universities. Just thinking about the squeeze in universities. <laughs> Yeah, true. We need this systemic change, you know, absolutely. Okay, so I was going to take it in a slightly different direction. So we've got in the room a range of different researchers. We've got people from community controlled organisations or have worked in those backgrounds. So I assume we've also got data custodians in the room. When you're working with Indigenous data, what are the things that often come to mind that would be a barrier for you to ensure that you are either connecting with the right data custodians or um, ensuring that you are following particular protocols that you think should be in place? What, what do you think are some of the barriers that we need to work on? So I, I work on... <clears throat> collections in Australia that come from Papua New Guinea, the Pacific and other places. And these are collections that would be lost if they weren't digitised and the people in those places can't get them. So when you're doing this stuff, there's always risk. And I think the problem is that we often allow the risk to outweigh the benefit. And so for what we're doing, the benefit is that this stuff can get back to those people. There's a catalogue online they can find. We take it back to local cultural centres and agencies for them to find these materials, which are their grandparents, you know, I mean, it's, it's that kind of thing. But the risk is, you know, we're the colonialists, we've got this stuff, we're in Australia, they're in the Pacific. So, you know, we, you have to balance all that stuff up. But if you don't balance it up and you just say, oh, the risk is too great, we're not going to do it, let's just forget about it. Well, they're the ones in the end that will not get access to that material. So I think, you know, being an ally, I suppose, isn't just everything that, you know, everything that's non-colonial is great, everything that's colonial is bad. You've got to weigh these things up. So I think it's complex and you should be prepared to engage in complexity as well. Yeah, thanks, Nick. Absolutely. I think we all see that in our work. And it does take courage, I think, sometimes to sort of absolutely say, well, the risk is not going to be as high as what it is if you don't do the, whatever action it is to whether it return the data or material or there's always going to be a way that uh, our institutions will often ensure that they place the legal risk frameworks around us that makes it really problematic. But I think some of those things we need to think through a little bit better as well, particularly when we know that a lot of Indigenous knowledges are being lost um, and Look, I think it's the job of all of us to ensure that um, 
we do as much as we can to preserve and maintain the knowledge that still remains. Yeah, and, and I'd probably say, like, you know, you're looking at diversifying and maturing your risk appetite in that sense, then, you know what I mean? No, I'm, and I mean that wholeheartedly. It's just like, you know, a lot of Aboriginal communities and stuff, it's just like, we, we, we're seen as like, you know, high risk taking, whatever, but that is by default the position that we find ourselves in, right? It's just like, i would give an example of the COVID like pandemic. I think that's a very good um, thing that'll illustrate it is that we had the ACO sector, the Aboriginal Community Control Health Sector working over above and beyond, getting stuff done, working through it. We did not have the time and the ability to, or the luxury, I should say, to wait for a clinical governance model to come down from department. So in, in that sense, we used data, we used research skills in an ACO to diversify and we built that clinical model three months ahead of government. Do you know what I mean? We, we have to head towards risk. We move through risk, not around it. So it's just like, you know, when I say, oh, maybe we need to like diversify and mature our, our risk appetite. That, that's kind of what it is. So being brave, you know? So. Any other comments? Particularly to do, I guess, with the type of work that we're in. Well, I know not everyone's working specifically within Indigenous data, but Indigenous data is usually in most data. Um, I know that a lot of the people that we've worked with before are very, very hesitant to do anything about it because they're very unsure. So they may want to be allies, but they don't know what to do about it and are terrified to kind of take that next step um, and really want some sort of assurance. Um, often, I think I mentioned it before, the IDN gets all sorts of queries ranging from really basic to broader, but the IDN in, in particular, we do not have the resources. <laughs> there does not seem to be any sort of national body to deal with any of this. I mean, we've got a team on the ground of what, Levi, maybe? All together. All together. Yeah, uh, like 14 maximum but yeah. that's in kind i mean yeah. in terms of funded through the idea and i think we've got three three, three positions, three positions time, yeah. so we definitely don't have the capacity there doesn't seem to be resources going in anywhere else but there is an absolute need in order for allies to actually become allies yeah. for some of this support to be going on so Knock it off. <laughs> <laughs> that mic was on, by the way. On the, risk, <laughs> on the issue of risk, risk management is part of a, it's a fundamental part within a standard governance framework. But what you identified, Levi, is things that are not being identified. It's the cultural risks and what defines cultural risk versus standard risk. And that's the level of cultural we need to precede words like psychology and sociology with cultural. And what are the cultural risk elements that fit within a shared governance framework in this framework that you're working on for the, and call it a shared governance is a reciprocal thing because you can't achieve what you need to achieve. I was talking to Robert um, the other day and we drew on a napkin. If you look, if you put the Aboriginal people that you want to engage with in a circle in the middle of a page, that's where you want to get to. But what you've got to understand is that to get into that circle, there's a whole level of layers of complex trauma. If you go into a stolen generations circle, the trauma is even more complex than what it would be to be brought up in Cherbourg or Warabinda versus Christian mission versus government reserve. That's the level of detail we've got to get to truly understand how to engage authentically and with integrity and honor in this space. So when you come in from Western governance, you're talking on an outer circle where it's about performance and accountability, starting with leadership and strategy, um, policy procedure, risk management, um, monitoring, reporting. That's all your, your standard Western stuff that's on the outer circle but you still got to get into that inner circle now there are people like levi who can go into that middle circle and understand the trauma and live the trauma day in day in you whether you like it or not you, you you still got it when you're working down the road here 
Correct. Okay, so that's the old notion of 24 seven. You can go home, but he, he can't because mm -hmm. it's clicking over and to you, it'll be still clicking over too, but different dimensions of it. So to get out of this process, there's a, <clears throat> there's a, a need to build trust, mutual understanding, respect and trust. My time working in Aboriginal affairs, I can say that, you know, I've heard the terminology that it's an industry, it's an industry, uh, and a lot of people do well in this industry. It's like in the incarceration space, we're the highest incarcerated people in our own country, we're po impoverished um, and oppressed in our own land, we're welfare bound on our own country. So... We are an industry, and in an incarcerated space, people get paid good money to work in incarceration to, to keep us under control. Historically, you'd be controlled in a mission or a reserve, but now they can't do that. So the next alternative is prison. It's clear logic to me that the system is operating the way the system wants it to be. There's reasons why we're oppressed. And the opposite to privilege is oppressed. So when you start to evolve forward, you've got to really peel back the layers and really get to the core because you're trying to get into that inner circle where there's a series of steps that'll allow you to come halfway in. And you'll never ever expect it to get into that inner circle of trauma, but he's in there. He'll come out and meet you halfway, which is what happens. But you'll go back to a Western government system, university system framework of thinking. He'll go back into the community. So somewhere you've got to understand him and he's got to understand you, but you two are allies. You have to value and respect the contributions that you each bring, but you've got to agree to meet somewhere in the middle, which is not in his space and he will never get to your space. Well, he could get to your space and you could get to his space, but that's the big picture. Yeah. And that's yeah. why I harp on about shared governance. 42 years, same shit, different day. In many ways, and that's not saying this of here, um, the, the amount of government rhetoric, I can take you back to a report I remember. Steve, you'll remember that, the Miller report. Yeah, it was all well, about making a concerted effort, yeah. a, a concerted attempt to change the social economic circumstances of Aboriginal and Torres Strait people. Yeah. <laughs> it's the same shit, different day. So again, what you're on a pathway, you're on a journey, but you have to get the shared governance framework intimately unpacked and restacked. And you've got all the key players in this room, if you catch them on a picture. That all come from your risk analysis stuff, mm. Levi. I've got a few things I'll wrap up at the end. Well, how are we for time, actually? <laughs> <laughs> I have a, another comment from Dr. Jelena Haynes, who apologizes because she can't be on the video right now, uh, saying that uh, she works alongside the elders for 20 years and our concern now is to access financial support to digitize recorded knowledge that has been recorded and some of the elders are no longer around. I think that's also a common thing in in many communities. I know that where we work, it, it certainly is happening everywhere. the The lack of resources in that space is really quite shameful. I think at a national level, mm -hmm. because as as we all know, Indigenous knowledge, a lot of it is all there is is on these tapes, <laughs> and once they're gone, what is the deadline? It's twenty twenty five. If it's not digitised by then, it's gone forever. So I think, you know, that's another thing where there really needs national advocacy to ensure that there are appropriate resources going into digitisation. But once we digitise it, there also needs to be the infrastructure to both store it and ensure that it is held in perpetuity and looked after and managed properly in a way that is right for the community who belongs to it. I guess one of the other things I'll probably mention is ultimately the ID and is wanting to function and, you know, really kind of uh, enrich uh, community of practice. Um, so, yeah, we would encourage anyone to kind of come along to that as well. Like I said, only one of three staff that function the IDN and is like, I'm a big boy, but there's only so much of me to go around being spread, uh, spread possibly fit at the moment. 
And obviously it'd be woefully ignorant of me to think that I had all the answers and all the solutions. That is clearly just not the case. <laughs> so what I like, you know, one of the lovely things is, is day in, day out, day I do work besides Kristen. Um, so all things feel really possible. Uh, only 10% jaded. The other <laughs> part of me is like starry-eyed optimistic. So yeah, would love to like fold other people into that space as well. Um, and because the thing is, it's it's about collective knowledge too, right? For a shared goal. And what benefits Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, people collectively benefits everyone, right? It's a positive curb theory. So, anyone with final thoughts before we get it wrapped up? Oh. Yeah, just oh, <laughs> I know I seem to rave on a bit. It's just a social work thing, <laughs> but um, when you you made me think of. Um, it's it's one of the like I I lecture lecture to in in bringing people together and hopefully win a few allies in uh, social work and also got some psychology students this sem this semester I think um, it's about this thing of um, having uh, when you you know like about that allyship how do you like and we're always hoping that we get people into that space. We're at the end of the course that they're on board as an ally and sometimes one one of the things we say about people is that you're not losing your culture if you learn about Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people what you're doing is you're actually gaining and that's the same thing with all different cultures you're actually expanding your world and you're gonna you're actually gonna know about other people's world and you'll be a better person. I know that sounds really hairy fairy, doesn't it? But but when you actually take on other people's cultures and you start learning about that, suddenly your world expands rather than putting the wall up going, oh, how come these Aboriginal people, what's this referendum thing about? What do they want a treaty for? You know, like people put that wall up. You don't need to put that wall up. You need to expand it and say hey come on let's go for it see what happens here and see what I might learn from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people but then also what you may share with them from your culture um I have you know I have friends from overseas and um met a lot of really good people from the Ukraine and you know like you think of think of that you know, and they and and sad to say I've been invited over there a couple of times, but I haven't gone. And and I'm just saying to you, expand, expand, just you know, expand yourself. How are you gonna work with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? I think that was a brilliant way to wrap it up, unless we oh no, we do have one more. <laughs> um this is slightly more general comment I'd like to make, but it does clearly relate with this discussion, particularly Levi, the discussion about risk. I think anybody who's been in this room for the last two days can have no doubt that all the strands of this enterprise we're joined in are deeply serious <laughs> about the risk management aspect of handling data. And, and this is a topic I've actually discussed with Steve McEachan along the way, and I think I mentioned it to Jenny sometime. I think we should consider the possibility that we can renegotiate with universities some aspects of who takes responsibility. And what I'm thinking of here is that people who are committed to putting data through our processes should get benefits in the ethics process from that. The university should be able to say, you're putting your data with IDN, fine, we tick every box because we know mm. that it will be managed responsibly. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. That was the way to finish. <laughs> thank you, guys. Sorry if I got ranty. Yeah, thank you, everyone. <laughs>
And the same as young Robert, the same. It's a, it's Mac is the same. It's about just acknowledging the work that you're doing and giving you the authority to continue to do what you've got to do. Not that you need our authority, but you're just being respected for all the effort that you do. That's what our older generation need to do with the younger ones. Build each other up and not pull each other down. Yeah? So I'm from here. Um, I'm going to just give you a general... I pulled out words. I've been writing down words um, over the last couple of days to try and piece it all together for me. The first one is, holy shit. No, it's not. Um, it was starting to be talked about there. Um, in the data space, this is just me asking questions, who has been privileged and what was the opposite of privilege in the context of data? And the opposite of privilege, as I touched on just then, was oppression. Um, when it comes to allies, it's an important thing. One of the things that allyship's all about is that you've got to understand your own privilege first before you can actually go out and engage with others. You've got to take the first step. You'll make mistakes but you've got to learn from your mistakes. So in the data research commons and indigenous research, you're going to make some mistakes, but as you said, Simon, <laughs> these are all here together. You're all allies already. You just got to consolidate and strengthen that. Um, I think there's a need to define and sell what value data in a modern society brings to First Nations communities across our diverse landscape because a lot of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities on the ground would not know, understand half of the things that you're talking at, at the levels that you're at. And you need your liaison type persons that can go halfway and meet. So they're, the, they're your internal allies. So sell, the, sell what value it and the value that it can bring for a whole range of other related things for the community. Shared governance, obviously needs to be trauma-informed, healing-focused, and culturalised, for whatever better word. Um, and it needs to have its own sort of a reconciliation focus. Up until this point, Aboriginal people's access to data has been probably limited, but you're actually creating an opportunity to, to enhance that. Your capacity to access all the necessary data that you need has been limited. It's the evolution of how technology works. Um, three projects operating and a few other components that we've heard over the last two days. And I wrote down to myself, um, respectful, collaborative, ethical relationships have to exist between all three. And you need to be streamlined. You need to do what you do, value your own autonomy, project autonomy, but you need to recognize that you're running parallel with each other to a common a common end. Mutual trust. You need to have establish mutual trust across your projects with each other. You need to think about notions of, and you haven't seen this yet or this language, but kinship leadership or kinship led project approaches. By that, so on, that's kind of what you were saying, is, is the valuing the, the unique and special skills of every individual here, what you bring to this process for the benefit of all. You have to support each other. If one of the project teams are suffering, well, then you, the others help out in some way. You do that in, in your own autonomous groups, but in the context of the three projects that we've talked about here, you've got to keep an eye out for each other, in my mind. And I might not be right, but... So there's mutual trust, respectful, collaborative, ethical research, that's accessible, streamlined, trauma-informed, healing focused, and underpinned or guided by your fair and care principles. Um, that's about all my waffle. Um, what I want to do before I hand you back to Jenny, Jenny and Michael. Now I haven't heard Michael, he's been as quiet as a mouse all day yesterday, but I do want to hear him by the end, but not just yet. I want to go table by table and just give me your takeaway thoughts for the last two days. 
And I want you to hand it to my deadly sister over there with the blonde hair, because she had something to say earlier and it was worthwhile saying. And we're going to go, be honest. Hi, everybody. My name's Alicia. <laughs> Um, and I'm also a social worker, so I apologise in advance if I waffle. Um, over the last two days, I guess, I've heard a lot of things that have been out of my depth or beyond some knowledge, technical things. I've learnt about um, methodologies for doing things and lots of awesome tools. But um, the thing that I kept coming back to is um, I, I wonder if the real depth of if the people in this room realize um, there's people at the end of these methodologies. So I work for a community controlled organization. Um, I've spent a long time working um, with vulnerable families on the front line. And some of the things that you're doing have significant real world impact to people. Um, life changing things like reunifying children, kin mapping families when people thought their identities were lost. And so I'm just, yeah, this last two days has been brilliant for me around um, seeing all these big systems, big picture things, but just trying to remember that there's communities at the bottom of this. Um, community controlled organizations are on the front line of gathering some of your data. Uh, we're the ones that are gathering that um, and, um, you know, we, we're the ones that go out and hold community trust and so I just, I think about that and I think about how we can apply some of these tools and make sure we're maintaining community, tr we're maintaining community trust. It's important to us. Yep. And that's fair. That's feedback on the run. Any other comments from that table? Look at this. Oh, John, you're going, I knew you was going to say something, John. No. But you need a strong cultural foundation and, and understanding, appreciation of what ancient ways can be applied in modern days in many ways. And to me, that's that's the conversation needs to start that you start with to actually truly get an authentic shared governance framework and approach. Now, this lucky gentleman over here is sitting by himself. Takeaway message for the last two days. Um, sometimes I reflect, I've got an 11 year old and we live in the same house, but we like live in different worlds. You know, his, his view of the world is so different from mine. I, I wonder if we have the same kind of thing between Indigenous and non-Indigenous. We live in the same land, but we live in different worlds. Mm. And we maybe we need to build a bridge across those worlds. And mm. Well, who's going to start? That's the conversation, isn't it? How do we build mm. the bridge? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. The amount of people that are in this room that are from different sectors that are like white fella, black fella as well. We this is the bridge in the commons, in the research commons is the beginning of the bridge of the two worlds. Mm. Um, I was really inspired by what was said yesterday around like there's only black fella ways and there's space for you in it. And like the invitation for all of us to participate in the one world, which is Australia. I don't, mm. I'm not sure that it's two different worlds. So, yeah. Ancient ways, modern days, it's as part of the answer is in building a strong sense of kinship and kinship respect back to humanity um but again it's it's you're right here you've got a whole group of different people who are all individuals that are all invested in this space but you're all family so your family in this data common space but you all have your own individual idiosyncratic ways and methods of thinking and being and that's okay that's what makes it interesting but support each other and build the bridge. And it's the old saying that, you know, it, we can say that that's okay, but where Aboriginal people sit, it's like the Liberal Party ideology was that everybody starts on the same line. You're familiar with that? The only one that starts on the same line were white males, land hunting males predominantly. So black people are back here, 
um, migrants, Indian people not here, Italian Swedes back here, women back here. So we've got to break down those barriers and get better understanding, that sort of stuff. But do it together. We are one, we are many from all the lands and earth we come. That would be a good start. Yeah, you all over this way. Okay. I was no, just, I was can way. I just, can I jump on that, that bridge building thinking? Hmm. I was thinking if you're going to build a bridge there <clears throat> between those two worlds, I mean, one world has this a whole heap of knowledge in there in terms of sustainability. I mean, it's sustained for 80,000 continuous living years. So there's a lot of reason to build a bridge and access that knowledge in many respectful ways. And I'm sure from that world that if we're living in, like fellas, we'd build that bridge. But you see, on our land, our access to our resources are all locked up. We can't, how do we build that bridge in that sense? When the purse strings are held by governments and successive governments who have made decisions that have effectively caused the problem that we are in. Now, when we talk about Indigenous data <clears throat> governance and that more broadly and the problems we face with that today, <clears throat> it is the imposition of colonisation as to why we're working in this space. If that didn't exist, we would know very clearly because those governance lines that had existed for thousands of years would have continued. The sharing of knowledge of, of Indigenous data would not have been imposed upon too. So I think the impacts of colonisation is pretty important, it is a keystone to the... And, and we're all aware of this because we're all working in that space and, and it does impact, you know, what we're, what we're doing. But I just wanted to raise that point specifically, um, just around access to do it. And the very one of, one of the very simple solutions comes back to putting... Black, the right black fellas in those positions to make those decisions as well, you know, to work with other black fellas too. So it's, you know, they talk about Indigenous led, Indigenous first, those kind of concepts, putting that at the forefront, putting them in, in control of those resources to build their half of the bridge, <laughs> to use the analogy. Well, value, value the contributions. And I'll come back to this table over here and we're heading this way. Uh, there's a challenge for this table over here. Work out who you want to speak. Not yet, but I... <laughs> um, I think I probably just want to say that um, old is new and new is old. Um, I've actually got a lot out of today in terms of um, context and scene setting, really, and contextualisation. And a lot of this is... Um, it's new, but it's old and it's all intertwined. And having a look at it in terms of um, government policy and processes, engagement with stakeholders, building in Aboriginal community control, because that is so important, but also building in um, our communities, building in our Indigenous worldviews and building in our families in terms of some of the things that, that you've been saying. Um, I'm um, here um, with IATSIS and I think in terms of some of our engagement, um, some of our engagement has been old, but it needs to be new and we need to really kind of embed ourselves in some of this process and this discussion going forward in the way that we probably should have been um, historically over the, the last little while. So, yeah, old is new, new is old. Thanks. Yeah, and that reminds me again of the allyship where in an ally to be a good ally you you're allowed to make a mistake you can, you will make mistakes there's no no such thing as perfect and no one has all the solutions but you have to work together but if you continue to make the same mistake well then you've got a problem uh, and i'll go back to my gentleman friend at the back and i should have said from a cultural kinship point of view your 11 year old son is my 11 year old grandson in a con in a kinship context. Uh, if I was your your brother, well, he's I'm uncle father to your son. If something happens to you, I've got a responsibility to steer your son on the right path. That's what kinship's about. And that's what this process can be all about. Simon, you lucky duck, you get your own. Hey. Um, I think I'm going to sound like Pollyanna here. 
but I'll go ahead anyway. A few minutes ago, I said that if you've been in this room for the last two days, you couldn't doubt that we were serious about certain issues. And I like to expand that and say, you couldn't be doubt that we are serious about tackling these incredible problems. And I think on the basis of having a group of people who are serious about the problems and have goodwill in their hearts, we can make progress and we are starting that journey. Yeah, well, you're actually well and truly on that journey. Now, Simon's been very quiet and I want to hear his lovely, soft, gentle spirit and voice come to the fore. Take away message, Simon, before I hand you back to... Hey? Well, Simon, I'm looking at you, Michael, and I'm talking. I'm talking, looking at you, and refer. Oh, shut up, Brad. Yeah, I don't feel like I'm the right person to speak because I'm actually very much a beginner on this journey, and um, I did want to just uh, um, convey my respects to the people in the room who've been working such a long time. Um, I think probably what's required here. Um, you know, if anyone from NCRIS is listening, um, I think what we're starting in this room is something which will be useful for the whole landscape of research infrastructure, not just the HASS bit. Um, and I think what you've been really conveying very well is it's, it's when you talk about a bridge, the, the traffic goes both ways, right? Um, and there's a lot of talk, um, I feel, about um, communities needing to be helped. That's one direction. But I think the other direction is there's a lot of help that can come from communities for this country. Um, and it's there's a lot of wisdom and there's a lot of good practice that this country would benefit from enormously. And if you thought of it that way, gosh, wouldn't you invest in the other side of the bridge, mm. right? Yep. So I, I think seeing it as, as a two-way bridge is really, really important to, to value that. So it's been a, yep. a great experience so far. And again, it's it's valuing the individual knowledge skill set that you bring, each, each of you bring to this whole thing. I've got a set skill set, you've got a set skill set, but I need you as you need me sort of thing. Um, same thing. This, and I don't think we put enough emphasis on how we value other people's knowledge and skill sets. That's that's important part of this process. Now, Neil, I'm going to come to you as the esteemed old timer on this table. Uh, uh, Len, Len, Len. Yeah. I'm uh, hitting that time of the day. I'm calling Charlie Brown. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Uh, look, um, I, I, this was, th th there's been a really strong Indigenous focus on our discussions, and that's really great. Um, I suppose if we step back a bit, uh, we're really talking about building institutions which are addressing the data needs of First Nations people and the Australian community uh, as a whole. And um, I think just to tick it off. I think we need to particularly pay attention to the fact that the program of work that's uh, that Jenny's sort of led us on uh, ha has some notable gaps. And I, and I keep saying that the one that worries me most is that there's not enough focus on the humanities and there's almost no focus on the arts. Um, so next stage, somehow that's got to be addressed. Uh, in terms of the the Indigenous program, what I keep coming back to is how all this is going to fit into the voice and truth telling, especially. I think the role of information and data is going to be absolutely central in that. And I think the sort of institutional arrangements that, that support the voice, you know, are, I think well, today we're probably looking at the seeds of what that is, those institutional arrangements are going to be. So, you know, let's build on that. Yep. And before we leave that table, I'm going to go to that handsome looking fox there that scrubs up like cross between uh, Scott Morrison and Bob Ork. You haven't said nothing while you've been here. I want you to tell us what your take well, on the message is. Um, yeah, look, uh, for me, I come from an organisation um, 
that looks at or talk the conversations around infrastructure and data uh, in a totally different context. So this has been really rich for me to sort of come back to that understanding that um, data is not just about like ones and zeros, just from a technical point of view, that there's embodied in that a, a people, a stories, a, a culture. So I think that'll be something interesting for us to go back to our organization um, because it's very IT focused uh, to, to sort of, again, come back to, you know, why are we, why are we supporting as an organization research? What are we trying to move towards and, and help reinforce and not lose sight of that? And that's, I suppose, a better future. I think I'll leave it at that. Yep, you did well. Now I can go to this young lady over here who's also sat there in that same spot. And had young lady is kind. Thank you. <laughs> um, my name is Sarah Polkinghorn. I'm based at RMIT, but I've actually just recently arrived from Canada. So my takeaway is just all the learning that that you've made possible. Uh, I certainly came to the right place just in terms of getting oriented to this whole space and the conversation here. Um, and of course, coming from Canada, that's kind of where my mind is also going because of course the conversation is not identical, but a lot of the a lot of the challenges are similar, but a lot of the opportunities and strengths and maybe potential connections are are parallel and, and similar as well. So so just just thanks and and uh, it's been a real pleasure to sit back and take lots of notes and try to absorb. And you've been joking about the acronyms, but yeah, that's that's a that's a real <laughs> that's a real thing. But uh, to no one's surprise, so just just appreciation on my part. This table here. Yeah, see you, lucky duck again. I'm a lucky duck loner on a table. <laughs> I would just like to say thank you for opening this up, the yeah, open invitation. It's been a real honour and um, uh, lovely for you to say that, um, you know, as allies we're allowed to make mistakes and that's a real relief. Thank you. <laughs> because I, I think it takes some, um, some you know, guts and gruel to kind of walk together and um, he heal together, um, trauma moving forward and putting um you guys in a you know position of power because I think you've got a real opportunity at the moment I think there's a real taste for it you know at e-research Australasia this year or last year it felt like every second talk was oh and we want to embed the care principles so I guess um you guys Indigenous lead can shape how you want that to look and I look forward to yeah joining your journey so thanks Whatever comes up will be in partnership with yourselves. <laughs> uh, this checkered fox here, look, hasn't said much. Oh. Hello. Um, hey. So I'm actually part of the team uh, in the Indigenous Studies Unit. Um, and these are the types of conversations that we have every day, uh, almost every day, right? About data, and I'm a, I'm a data analyst, I'm a sociologist, uh, quantitative sociologist. So we talk about these issues every day, and it's really good to see that these conversations are now kind of being had in a in a group setting with people from different backgrounds. Uh, I wasn't here yesterday. I was um, I was busy with um, uh, basically doing the same thing, but with, uh, with other people uh, in the office, but just coming in here today at around uh, noon, um, seeing people who are part of our team. So Len and Sandra and, and Nick, John, all the way back uh, with whom we're uh, also partnering as well as uh, some old colleagues from other departments around the university who are here. Uh, it's just a great, it's great to see people involved with data from different backgrounds. And again, kind of like goes back to what Kristen was saying, that data has different meanings to different people. I know as a, even though I'm in the kind of the social science space, the way I think of data analysis is at times very different to the way that somebody else um, in a, maybe an adjacent field uh, would, would think about um, data. So it's just a very good feeling. It's a good feeling of camaraderie and, and also being able to have these conversations outside of our <laughs> small office over there on Grattan Street. It's uh, very good to be here. So thank you very much. And uh, thank you. Um, and thanks uh, to Kristen as well, who's uh, my boss, but also um, <laughs> someone who uh, had a lot to do with um, um, organizing this session as well as Jenny and her team as well. So 
Thank you. Now, before you hand that microphone over, can you say this? On a cold and gray Chicago, born and another little baby child was born in the ghetto. <laughs> Don't you reckon, Simon? Come on. And his mama cried. <laughs> Levi, what's that? Your boss is sitting there. You got to do it now. <laughs> We laugh with, not that. Vortek, what's your takeaway? Thanks so much. Yeah, look, I, um, yeah, just really happy to be here. I think it was a really great opportunity for me um, to learn much more about the other two projects of DACA and the indigenous research capability. I, you know, we, we just talked today about, about kind of building bridges and connections. And I really like your, your words around, you know, helping each other out and so on. And I do think, you know, for me, um, it's, I've only been involved in, in, in the Iris project for, you know, about 12 months. And, and obviously, I think for the other projects as well as for us, the focus has been on, you know, we haven't had much time. So, you know, we just try to demonstrate something, you know, build something between, you know, the time that we, within the time that we had basically until the, the end of June this year, you know, we, we, we all kind of worked within our kind of projects to, to, to do something and to be able to demonstrate something. And, you know, as you could have seen within the iris project there is enough complexity you know navigating the six working packages and so on but i do think now is the time to actually kind of maybe start thinking and move a, a little bit beyond the projects and you know as we as we as we move into the future you know there's this really you know i can see possibilities you know for example you know the indigenous uh, research capability and obviously stuff around data governance that we'll have to engage with the the, the geospatial aspect so you know it's great to see those um, presentations and, and, you know, find out about those things. And, and these are the kind of things, I think, connections and how we can work together. And, and you know, obviously, everybody's going to have to maintain that sort of internal focus as well, you know, keep keep pushing things forward. But then, you know, how, how, how can we reach beyond the, the individual projects and try to do something together? Hmm. Michael and I had a sort of a discussion around future. It's, we're talking about data and research data commons now in 2023, but what was what will the conversation be in 2073? So think ahead, the, the past, present, future, and that's where I think your focus should be also. And now, this is this is why this this um, event here, yeah, the symposium, is a great you know great thing to bring us all together. Yeah. Uh, we'll go to the back bench, and I'll go to the middle gentleman sitting in the middle. <laughs> Hello everyone, that... I'm Jonathan Bolland and I I teach theatre and performance studies um, in a school of arts and media, so it's really interesting to hear the conversations about um, about the scope for arts and, and creative arts data to um, come into the commons, and I can certainly see the potential for that. I also think that, um, that there are... Um, <coughs> Approaches in the creative arts that are that really resonant with um, some of what I've been hearing and learning about uh, from um, First Nations peoples and Indigenous perspectives on data, about the way data is um, uh, not only you know counted and visualised but also embodied um, and shared and and communicated through song, dance, and and uh, storytelling and in gathering as well in bringing people together. Um, so all of those, um, the social architecture dimensions is something that's shared with the um, with the creative arts, and I I think there are also um, uh, a lot of scope to be um, working with uh, creative people to make sense of data. That's that's one of the things that I've been working on, um, looking at the the uh, theatre companies who are who are who are using data to create performance so rather than writing scripts or or um uh or or you know gathering stories they're actually turning data into into creative works of art i think it's a really interesting time so um thank you for the opportunity to listen into these conversations thank you very much uh, to each and all and um joe joe yeah, thanks. Oh, online. Who's online? Online. We have a few comments from online. So uh, Dr. Jelena Haynes says, ideas learned from the 
from the two days were respect, trust, mutual relationship and reciprocity. Ancient and modern days needs to coexist and work together. Uh, Maria Weaver said, um, as a librarian working, relatively recently started in the data commons space, I've gained a lot of learnings from this symposium and I hope to continue learning and expanding my understanding more over time. I appreciate all the comments and insights from everyone. Thank you so much for sh the sharing and openness. Uh, Jennifer Rumble, Dr. Jennifer Rumble from, uh, she's a Camilla Roy woman from at Newcastle University, says that she really appreciates this space to hear groups talking and sharing respectfully, hearing too that people are looking at lost and orphaned data by bringing together in a and bringing together in a central space for many purposes. Keen to hear more as the IIRC and IDN, great work, thank you. And thank you to Uncle Grant for your wisdom in guiding us. And uh, Robin Burgess from ARDC is the research data specialist in data governance at the ARDC. And he's thrilled to hear about the importance of data governance being mentioned so much. <laughs> and he looks forward to hearing more in this area and learning more and contributing to future discussions. So thank you. Thank you. And can you thank uh, just the online audience? It's always difficult not to be able to see, but thank you for their consistent contributions and questions that they raised, which was very important. Um, thank you, Joe, for the work that you do behind the scenes to get this stuff. Um, Mary, thank you also, because um, you do a lot of things behind the scenes. I wouldn't recommend eating six hot dog, um, hamburgers at lunch anymore. No, she didn't. Um, but you're know, part of the Jimmy team knows. that helps Jenny. And, and they're things in a kinship-based arrangement. It's easy to get up here and do what I got to do. But I rely on you. And that's an important thing that needs to be valued. So they're things that we need to embrace across this whole process. What's your name, sister? Yeah, you know I'm looking at you. What's your name? Sonia. Sonia. Good on you, Sonia. You've done a deadly job too. <laughs> and old brother Fox up here, look. What's your name? Steve. Good on you, mate. Thank you. Um, thank you each and every one of you for your participation over the last two days. It's been always, it's a pleasure to come and spend time in the presence of unique and special souls. And it's my pleasure to, and uh, well, it's not a pleasure, it's just great for me personally to see people come together and treat each other like family and respectful. And that's what it's all about. That's what caring, sharing and respect is all about. And that's who we are. We're all children of the universe here. Some of us have had a bit better than others, but we're all in the same, we're all in the same ballpark trying to do the same thing. And on that note, I'm gonna hand it back to Jenny and Michael. Uh, who's gonna close it up? Peter, Peter's gonna come up too. It's all yours, Jen. <laughs> no, I did want to touch on what Grant said about kinship. When we started on this path back in June 2021, um, I think, you know, we were quite a diverse group of people. We still are a very diverse group of people. But what we have come together with is kinship. And we are very blessed that we all work well together and we've got one another's backs. And I think that that's really important. So, you know, we're a good team and we're willing to take more people into our family of Hassan Indigenous RDC. So thanks everyone for coming along. Thank you to everyone who helped out. Um, there's more food out there. <laughs> Uh, we're going to have a little planning session just for the partners. So, if um, but thank you to the rest of you who've come along, and hopefully we'll see you again next year. And thanks to everyone online as well. Thanks to my ARDC colleagues for their assistance. So yes, thank you everyone.